it's here, it's sticking around. We've got a little area of low pressure out to the west in the western Arkansas. That will be pivoting in our direction now. I'm going to watch these showers and thunderstorms right through here. We're going to watch those closely because as they start to pivot in our direction, they may kick up an isolated strong storm as we go towards the latter half of the morning into the afternoon hours. I think the higher chance of that will probably be east central Arkansas, north Mississippi. To the west of that, there's another area of rain and storms that has been developing out to the west. Those showers and storms will be heading in our direction as well. So it's a several waves of rain to contend with between now and Thursday. So we're not out of this just yet, my friends. So after today, there's more on the way. Obviously, rain jackets needed today. Uh, umbrellas needed today, no matter what you got planned out today. There might be a couple breaks here and there where the rain's not coming down heavily if, or at all. We may have some periods of time where the rain has uh, kind of calmed down. I think we'll have a little better chance of that late this afternoon into the early evening hours. But the biggest impact to you, heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. Crib, uh, creeks and rivers likely to have some water rises here in the next few days. Uh, I think we're going to get to the point to where we may get to a uh, to the minor flood stage even along the Mississippi River. It's going to be close. Uh, you know, it hadn't been uh, too long ago that we were talking about record low levels along the Mississippi River. But over the course of the last couple of weeks and months, um, you got to think about this. We went from 12 feet below gauge zero. Uh, now we're approaching almost 20 some odd feet. So, you know, we're, we, we've gained like 30 feet of water over the course of the last couple of weeks. And of course, uh, a little bit more to go and more on the way here in the mid south. How much rainfall could we see? Again, this is a generalized anywhere from two to four inches of rainfall. Some locally heavier amounts of five can't be ruled out as we go through the next few days. And the heaviest impact will likely be North Mississippi communities. I would say if you live in North Mississippi, you likely will stand to see anywhere uh, on the higher end, folks are three and five inches of rainfall. The far Further north that you go, West Tennessee, Missouri Boot Hill, northern portions of Arkansas. I, I think we're closer to like an inch or two, including here in the city of Memphis. We're closer to like two to three inches of rainfall between now and Thursday. Get underneath the heavy downpour, all bets are off, and that will uh, maybe uh, bring up your rainfall totals pretty quickly. Today, this is a severe weather outlook. Again, generally east central Arkansas, northwest Mississippi, where we have that strong storm risk that will come shooting across there with that area of low pressure. Second day. This is day two. This would be for Wednesday. Marginal risk for areas north of I-40, south of I-40, a, um, a, a slight risk. Go south of that, enhanced risk all the way down to I-20, I-20, moderate risk for strong and severe storms. Now, we're going to watch what's happening down south tomorrow because that will have implications what happens farther north because the moisture transport has got to go through a wall of water. Uh, that's going to come shooting across the I-20 corridor down that way between I-20 and I-10. That would be down towards Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, damaging wind threat, large hail threat, and a tornado threat emerging. Uh, I think there's going to be more so damaging straight line winds with embedded tornadoes inside of that, but those embedded tornadoes could have some bigger with them across this portion of the world. The farther north that you go, less of a tornado threat. I think it's just more so wind and hail potential in our neck of the woods, but we'll be watching it closely. Thursday, severe weather threat is not an issue, but we will still have some rain opportunities to play with. Here's a look at the first alert future cast. Again, rain off and on. There's your gusty storm threat that may emerge as we get towards the latter half of the morning and early afternoon hours across east central Arkansas, northern portions, uh, northwest Mississippi. That will shoot eastward. A little bit of a lull develops with lighter rain for the afternoon and evening commute, but there's another wave on the way for the evening and overnight period. No severe weather overnight. I think we get into tomorrow morning. We may have a relative lull in the activity before more rain develops for the afternoon and evening. Again, gusty storms possible there. That will continue through the afternoon commute for your Wednesday. A relative lull in the activity. More rain and storms developing out west, shooting eastward. That will take us into Wednesday night, early Thursday, as that will be kind of the end-all, be-all for the heavy rain aspect. Once this moves out of here, there will still be some sporadic showers on Thursday, and then the winds will also pick up as well. As I mentioned, anywhere from two to four inches of rainfall. There will be some locally heavier amounts. Some of these stripes in through here go four or five inches of rainfall inside of them. So we encourage you to be prepared for that. Low lying poor drainage flooding is more likely going to happen. And then in localized senses, 
could have some flash flooding, not completely off of the table uh, if it comes down quick, fast and in a hurry. So again, rain opportunities on and off as we go through the next couple of days. 90% rain chance today, 80% tonight, tomorrow, 60% rain chances th Wednesday as we start to get into a, a relative lull. Now we may have to up the rain chance on Thursday, uh, depending on how things play out, how quickly that area of low pressure can pull away from us. Uh, temperatures 60 to near 70 degrees today through Thursday, near 70 again on Friday, but at least brighter skies on the way. We'll go upper 70s for uh, Saturday, nearing 80 for Sunday, Monday with a chance for a few showers sneaking back into the fold as well. Andrew, as we get closer to uh, early portions of the next week. OK, and, and you know, for temperature wise, I mean, we're expecting showers. I mean, in the month of April, that usually is the case. But temperature wise, we look pretty much on par with what we're where we're supposed to be, right? Yeah, actually, I think they're average higher now is 71, 72. So we're a little bit below that here in the next couple of days or near that. Uh, and then we'll go above that. So we'll uh, by the end of the week, we'll probably average out where we should be just because of uh, how things play out. But uh, I think we're going to go into a warm stretch next week. Uh, highs in the upper 70s, low 80s uh, pretty consistently next week, but also a couple of chances for some rain to come back in here next week. But I, I would say, hey, look, you've got plans this weekend. I know um, the Redbirds are in town uh, this week. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I think their homestand starts today, uh, either today or tomorrow, and um, not looking great um, <laughs> for the first part of this, uh, but at least the weekend looking to uh, shape up pretty good for them. All right, meteorologist Patrick Ellis, uh, appreciate the download on the forecast and uh, the rainy temperature, the rainy conditions and uh, decent temperatures. We appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem. All right, let's now take a live look from our high five camera there in downtown Memphis. You can see it is uh, certainly wet on the lens in addition to uh, wet streets out there. Take it easy, take it slowly. We'll be back in 60 seconds with more on Action News 5's digital desk. There are so many studies these days that link your dental health to the overall body health. So in other words, there is more and more studies that say if you are not healthy in here, you're not going to be healthy in mentally or physically. And so it is so important to teach proper dental care from the very beginning for some of our youngest all the way up to um, our seniors out there. Let's talk about... Uh, children's dental health right now. I'm joined uh, by Mead Moore, pediatric dentist on the Action News 5 digital desk. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. So uh, tell me how much of an issue this is here in Memphis and the Mid-South. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Um, it's not just a problem here in Memphis, which it is, but it's also a problem uh, nationwide. According to the uh, Serves for disease control, 56% of kids between the age of six and eight have untreated um, dental caries. And that's a huge number. And it can be uh, reduced by people, parents taking care of their kids a little bit better and getting uh, professional consultations early. Uh, I like to see kids as early as one, one years old to check their enamel uh, ask parents about how they clean their teeth. It's a big problem, and there's nothing worse than, that, than a child having a toothache. It's really devastating. They can't eat, they can't sleep. Sometimes they can't even go to school. 
it's a real problem here in, here in Memphis State. Yeah, I understand that um, your offices are in Germantown. Uh, tell me about um, your clientele when it comes to, because you're a pediatric dentist, what do you see the most in terms of uh, problems that some of the children's teeth uh, have? The, the biggest problem is that uh, parents are not um, diligent enough to keep the teeth clean uh, during the day. For example, um, I'm recommending to parents clean the teeth at least twice a day, especially, most importantly, before they go to bed. A lot of kids get tired, they get whiny, they're not cooperative, they want to go to bed, they're tired. Well, I recommend to parents, go ahead and clean their teeth with a toothbrush, or um, there's a, a product called Spiffy's, which is a wet wipe for parents to wrap around their finger and then wipe it over the gums and get the gums clean, get the teeth clean before they go to bed. Or start brushing teeth earlier. You have to brush the teeth before they go to bed because the plaque builds up quickly. Plaque has bacteria. Bacteria secretes acids and acids hurts the gum tissue and forms cavities. You know, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there, doctor, um, and, and I'm sure you see it in your practice uh, almost on a, I'm sure, a daily, if, if not a weekly basis, where people's misconceptions about uh, dental care for children, oh, they have baby teeth, they're going to be fine, or, uh, you know, hey, they, you don't need to worry about this until their permanent teeth come out, but it, it's about habits, right? I mean, it, explain some of the misconceptions yes. out there. Yeah, uh, this, is the, this is a real big misconception. I can't tell you how many times we hear the, the sentence, well, they're just baby teeth. Why do I need to fix them? Why do I need to spend the money to fix them? If you've ever seen a child that has extensive decay and even infections, abscesses, uh, their faces are swollen, they're hurting, they can't eat, they can't sleep. Um, it's a real tragedy. Um, and like I say, there's so many kids out there that have untreated carries that it's just it's really surprising in this day and time that this is happening so you have to uh, be diligent about teaching your kids how to brush early and clean their teeth all the time um you know i don't have any coca-colas or colas at our house we just don't drink that because it's really bad for your teeth but people really have another misconception about how bad potato chips are fritos and all the chips that you see in the grocery stores, that's just full of carbohydrates. And you put that in the mouth, you chew it, it becomes a paste. If you don't clean the paste off, if you don't clean the potato chips off the teeth, that can cause cavities as well. It's very um, strange to see how quickly a cavity can form if you don't clean the teeth and get the carbohydrates and the sugars off. Um, so when I talk to parents, I say, okay, here's what you need to do. If they won't brush, use a wet wipe, a, a type of wet wipe called a spiffies. I don't get any kickback from that. I just know it works uh, for kids. They wipe it off, wipe the plaque off the gums, off the teeth, and that way they can go to bed without any problems developing cavities while they sleep. So let me ask you this. Um, what, about, what about a bullet bullet points for parents out there of young children. Um, what do you tell them in terms of providing the best oral care for your child when you're not going to see a dentist? Um, all right, first of all, I'm gonna back up one second and say it's very important for you to take your child to a pediatric dentist at the age of one or earlier if you see a problem. Genetics plays a big role in this also. Uh, I was just talking to a parent 20 minutes ago. He had terrible teeth when he was a child, and now the child um, luckily does not have any cavities, but I told she's prone to it. Be sure and clean their teeth very well. Let the dentist uh, check their teeth every six months. In my office, I'll see the children under age three for exam and check their progress and make sure they're cleaning right. At age three, we start the cleaning process, and they, by the time they're three, they're used to the office. They feel like it's a safe environment. The parents come back with uh, the child and we go very slow. I wanna make sure it's not like they're going to the pediatrician's office. They, they're not gonna get a shot at the dental office, okay? In the arm, in the leg or anything. So I want this to be a safe place, a place they feel comfortable, but they have to clean their teeth at home. 
parents have to watch out what kind of foods that they're feeding them, like the carbohydrates, the sugars. Um, when I first got out of dental school, going, putting the child to bed with a bottle full of either orange juice, Coca-Cola, or some other sugary drink was really rampant, especially here in Memphis. That's gotten a lot better, and that's due to public education. So it's watching what they eat, keep their teeth clean, and flossing. Now, flossing is a really interesting concept. Um, you, you know, people use little floss around their fingers, but there's now called um, floss sticks. You get them at the drugstore, get them at the grocery store, and they're much easier to maneuver around the child's teeth. So flossing also is very important to start. Around age three is what I recommend. Yeah, I have I have those, and my wife and I use them all the time. My kids are um, in college, and so you know we've uh, we've done our best uh, to uh, ensure uh, oral uh, health and and take them to a pediatric dentist uh, every six months. I guess it sounds like you know you, children's dental care and adult dental care are virtually the same. It seems like brush twice a day, see a, a dentist uh, every six months or so, and uh, and just get regular checkups. Um, Am I wrong with that? No, that's perfectly right. That's exactly right. Now, when you and I grew up, um, I was never told to floss. I mean, I don't think I flossed till I was in my late teens. Um, I didn't think that was necessary. I thought it was only to get chicken or corn from between your teeth. It was never told to me that you're supposed to be flossing to prevent decay. And that's the big change in the past 30 years, 20 years. And uh, people are now flossing a lot more. I drill this into uh, all my patients. And the first question I ask the older patients, because they've been with me maybe a long time, I say, okay, tell me about your flossing. How you doing? And they know I'm going to ask that question. And most of them are very sheepish and say, uh, I flossed about two weeks after I saw you, but then I quit. Well, I always drill it into the head. Please floss. It's not for my benefit. It's for yours. So flossing it with those floss sticks is great. One final thing before we let you go, Dr. Moore, uh, there's a big push to eliminate fluoride in drinking waters across the country. Some municipalities have done it um, because a uh, higher content of fluoride is uh, known to uh, damage the body in a number of different ways. Where do you stand on that? Oh, um, I think fluoride in uh, the drinking water is extremely important. We see a huge difference in the number of cavities kids have if they're on well water, say in Tennessee or Mississippi, versus kids who are drinking fluoridated water in Memphis. There's a dramatic change here. Um, I think the misconception is um, that you're getting too much fluoride. And then the biggest controversy is how much fluoride do you need in toothpaste? Do you want fluoride in toothpaste for a three-year-old, a two-year-old? My suggestion is a very small amount of toothpaste, no matter if it's fluoridated or not. But I recommend no fluoride until age three or four when they can spit. That's the key. If they're swallowing the toothpaste, I don't want them to have the fluoride. Uh, that can damage permanent teeth and make their stomach upset. So when they learn to spit, that's when you switch over to fluoridated toothpaste. But the fluoride in drinking water is extremely, I can't emphasize this enough, extremely important to prevent decay. And, and, and we're so lucky here in Memphis we have that. All right, Dr. Mead Moore, we appreciate you and, and everything that you do at, at your pediatric dentist business there. Thank you so much for uh, giving us an idea and really kind of shedding a light on how you should treat your children's um, oral health compared to uh, an adult's oral health. Thanks so very much.
Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. April 5th, 13th, that is a Saturday, there is an event uh, going on at Methodist. It's at the uh, transplant um, area at Methodist Le Bon are hosting an event with, for patients and loved ones uh, who are currently waiting for an organ. Um, let's bring in uh, someone who knows more about this event. Um, Gayatri uh, Jai Shanker uh, is an administrator for Methodist Transplant Institute, um, and she's here to give us more information about uh, this event on Saturday, April 13th. Uh, good morning, Gayatri. Uh, tell us about it. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you for having me this morning and giving me a chance to talk about this great event that we are going to be hosting this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Um, the event is called the Big Ask, Big Give. It is in partnership with the National Kidney Foundation. Um, and it essentially is um, an education program for the community, both for patients who are waiting for a kidney transplant or for anybody uh, who knows of somebody who is waiting for a kidney transplant um, on how you can be a living donor. Um, so not only does it teach the patients um, various um, approaches and you know having those crucial conversations to get a living donor, uh, but also teaches uh, their loved ones how they can be advocates for the patients um, during this journey for them. How many people are on the list currently for a kidney transplant, Gayatri? So for a kidney transplant, we have almost 670 patients on the list just here in Memphis. Um, and many of them, the only chance for them to get a uh, kidney transplant is through deceased donation. Um, deceased donation, however, is a considerable wait time. Um, and for anybody on dialysis, you know that um, every year on dialysis is um, just so difficult and so uh, life changing for them in terms of um, their condition. Um, and so we want to educate the community that another way of getting a kidney transplant and probably the faster, more healthier way of getting a kidney transplant is through living donation. Um, and the Big Ask, Big Give is focused around living donation as a treatment option for kidney transplant. Is this event on Saturday just for patients on the list for a, a, an organ or um, is this for other people? So in other words, is this for the patients and the families that are currently on a list waiting for an organ or is this for the broad general public? That's a great question. So it is for both. Um, you know, it's targeted at patients who um, are waiting for a kidney transplant because it is most beneficial to them and, of course, their family members as they help their loved ones on this journey. But really, it's a community event because anybody can be a living donor. Uh, we have something called altruistic donors where uh, people just out of the goodness of their heart um, want to give the ultimate gift to somebody, which is um, being a living donor for somebody. And so this is a great program for you to understand what it means to be a living donor and make a more informed decision. Okay, and, uh, and so uh, living donor obviously is, is part of the conversation on Saturday. How does someone know if they're an appropriate candidate to be a living donor? Um, we have a team of wonderful nephrologists and amazing surgeons who do a very, very uh, thorough evaluation for anybody who may be interested in being a living donor. Um, so after the medical evaluation, um, if you qualify on the various criteria that we have on who can become a living donor, then we would put you through an evaluation and consider that. Um, the reason we do that is because um, you know, here's somebody who is healthy and uh, just out of the goodness of their heart, um, they want to come up and be a living donor for somebody. So not only is it our responsibility, but also an obligation to the living donor that we ensure that um, it is a safe option for them. And post donation, they can go back to a healthy, happy life as they knew it. I was just going to ask, tell me about the recovery process for a donor. What is it like? Um, how, how severe is it? And what kind of quality of life can a donor achieve after donation? Yeah. So um, we do uh, most living donor surgeries um, are laparoscopic. Um, 
the recovery time uh, for a living donor in the hospital immediately post donation is only about three to four days and most donors are able to go back uh, to their house after three to four days. Complete recovery takes about four to eight, eight weeks and uh, most donors are able to go back to all of their normal activities, their day-to-day -day activities in about four to eight weeks. Gotcha. Anything else that we can touch on before we let you go about this event, perhaps um, where people can get information about it online? Yes, um, we will have all of the information available on our Methodist Labona Facebook page. Um, and I definitely encourage everyone to stop by the page, get more information on this event. Um, we are really, really excited about this event. You know, last year we um, were able to do 348 organ transplants uh, because of various gifts that both deceased and living donors were able to give our patients and give them a second chance of life. Um, so we are very excited about this program uh, and all that it has to offer, and we are looking forward to hosting it this Saturday. All right, Gaia Tree, Jess Shanker, we appreciate you. Um, good luck with the event, and um, we, we appreciate all the info you've given us this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. April 15th, rapidly approaching. That is the tax deadline this year, and millions of taxpayers still haven't filed their taxes. There are some new tax laws on the books, and let's figure out if we're going to be affected by it or not. Let's bring in a tax expert. I'm joined right now by Lisa Green-Lewis. She is a CPA and a TurboTax expert we appreciate you joining us um lisa so tell us um tell us about these new laws and and who might be affected with that good morning good morning um yes so the first one i want to talk about it's really an adjustment and it's the inflation adjustments and they've been adjusted the most we've seen in decades about 7.1 percent so one of the inflation adjustments um it's the standard deduction and you know these really help people's tax outcomes if you're single you're going to get a deduction of 13,850 married filing jointly 27,700 and head of household 20,800 um the second one i want to talk about um energy efficiency credits so under the new provisions those really kick in in tax year 2023 uh, so before, if you put in energy efficient windows or doors in your home, that was up to $500 and that was lifetime. Under the new provisions, they got rid of the lifetime and they also increased the credit. So that credit is now $1,200 and you can get that every year. And then also electric vehicles. We all already had the $7,500 for new vehicles, but now you can get a credit up to $4,000 for a used electric vehicle. And then the last one I wanna talk about, child tax credit. It's not a new tax provision, um, but there's been a lot of buzz about the child tax credit expanding. And I just wanna emphasize along with, you know, what the IRS commissioner reiterated, um, people don't need to hold off on filing, waiting for that, tax law to expand because um, if it does expand, 
the IRS commissioner states that they'll adjust on their end. Okay, that's good information right there, Lisa. We appreciate it. Um, what do you have for people that have waited so long? We know there's procrastinators each and every year. It's 11 days out. Um, and, you know, each day <laughs> there's more people that are going to file, more people that are going to wait. What do you have for those procrastinators out there? Yes, first, don't panic, but get started. You could gather all your documents in one place, so documents that report your income, like W-2s and 1099s. And also, don't forget those documents and receipts for deductible items. And then you want to go online and e-file with direct deposit. That's the fastest way to get your tax refund. Okay, now there's some people that have started uh, side gigs or maybe have invested in crypto or bought a house, got married, life decisions here. What kind of advice would you have for them? Yes, just remember that the moves you make in life, there are usually tax benefits associated with it. So you mentioned crypto. It, so let's say you had a crypto loss. You can offset those losses against your gains and lower your taxes. Or if you started a side gig, which we are seeing an increase in people adding side gigs or becoming self-employed, remember that any expenses directly related to your business, um, you can deduct that. So supplies, um, mileage, travel, or your car expenses. And um, let's talk about uh, filing taxes after April 15th. Um, what's the process to do that and, and what happens? Yes, so if you can't make it to the deadline, you have to file an extension by April 15th. And just remember, if you owe money, that is only an extension to file and not an extension to pay. Yes. Big difference right there. Um, okay, what about someone who just wants some more information, um, is just needs some extra, extra guidance? Is there a place online they can go? Yes, they can go to TurboTax.com. Okay, anything else, Lisa, before we let you go? Anything else that you could tell us? Yes, I mean, if you... Uh, don't want to do your taxes yourself, you can go to TurboTax.com and fully hand your taxes over to our TurboTax Live full service experts. And you can also meet with our tax experts who are independent verified pros in person. Okay, Lisa Green Lewis, we appreciate uh, the time here on the digital desk. Thank you very much. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Make a wish grants wishes that can lead to improved medical outcomes. And they wouldn't be possible without the support of thousands of wish makers taking action behind the scenes. Today, Make a Wish is announcing a big goal to recruit 1 million to become wish makers. We are pleased right now on the Action News 5 Digital Desk to be joined by Leslie Motta, President and CEO of Make a Wish America, and WWE superstar, the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes, joining us on the digital desk. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, both of you. Good morning. Uh, Leslie, uh, first over to you. What is a wish maker and why are they so important to make a wish? Absolutely. A wish maker is any individual that gets involved with Make a Wish 
to enable wishes for our children. We all know the transformative power of a wish. They are absolutely life-changing. So all of those involved are wish makers. It's the everyday folks that volunteer, it's our individual donors, it's our superstars, our celebrities, doctors, nurses, corporate partners, and so much more. It really does take a village to grant a wish, and that's what a wish maker is. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I think most of us are familiar very much with Make-A-Wish and everything that they do. And thank you so much for leading such an important effort. Um, Cody, over to you. Why do you choose um, Make-A-Wish and Grant Wishes and be involved with this organization? I, I have, I'm familiar with probably some reasons why, but I'd like to hear it from you. Well, WWE uh, really has had this wonderful longstanding relationship with Make a wish. It's forty years. Mm -hmm. Over six thousand wishes have been granted. I, I feel when I got into the pro wrestling and sports entertainment game, you're, you're thinking about the the matches and the promos, and, and you're thinking about what you're going to be doing out there on that show that night. It doesn't really hit you that that's going to affect somebody, and then that effect they might they might wish for to meet you to have that experience with you know with their family and have that time. And that's the, the most beautiful gift of all. I think every superstar wants to have a championship title or something like that, no doubt. But to be able to say you were able to, to grant that wish and have that lasting moment, that's, that's, that's the most beautiful gift of all. Any day that I have a, a wish is, is an absolutely great day. I end up telling my wife about it on the phone. I talk about it all TV long just because it's so unique and so special. And, I'm really glad WWE and Make-A-Wish have that relationship. You know, Cody, that's fantastic. I, I want to um, press a little bit further with what you said because we saw so many pictures of you with some of those Make-A-Wish children there. Um, tell me what that means to um, not only you but the organization of WWE to have those fans there in the arena uh, while uh, there are various wrestling events going on. Well, I think in terms of you know what it means is it's such a high honor but also it's it's a fairly large responsibility uh, that that we as superstars or WWE wrestlers however we refer that we live up to what 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 they've seen and and, and their expectations uh, last year at WrestleMania uh, we had 20 something wishes in the circle of champions all in one day on a movie set at Universal Studios. And this year going into WrestleMania 40, 19 wishes are going to be granted Friday uh, before the event. But that's, uh, it's just, again, it's it's the highest honor, but I, I feel like it's a responsibility. Um, I, I mentioned John Cena in terms of holding that wish record of, you know, that we're all trying to chase him in terms of world titles and things of that nature, but that's the real record. That's the one that you want to get after because it will mean the most. It will be the most real thing that, that we ever do. Fantastic. Uh, Leslie, over to you. Um, we have thousands of people that watch us each and every morning here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. If someone's watching, they want to get involved, how can they become a wish maker? Absolutely. Go to wishmaker.com, wishmaker.com. We are so excited about April being our World Wish Month. We have a very ambitious goal. We want to recruit over 1 million wish makers to join us in making wishes come true for some very deserving children. There are so many ways to get involved. We encourage everyone to go to wishmaker.org. Okay, Leslie Motter, we appreciate you. And Cody Rhodes, the American Nightmare, thanks so much for joining us on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. And uh, we appreciate your time this morning.
Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Did you know that more than 6.5 million Americans live with an autoimmune disease that's called plaque psoriasis? The condition affects the skin. It cause, causes plaques, itchiness, flaking, and many people confuse it with other conditions like eczema. The disease can be physically and mentally debilitating, isolating, with a lot of misconceptions. Well, let's clear all that up right now. On the digital desk, I am joined uh, by Dr. James Song. He's a dermatologist and also Marjorie, who's decided to uh, tell us about her experience um, in her personal journey living with plaque psoriasis. Good morning to you both. I appreciate you being here on the digital desk. Uh, doctor, I want to start with you. Can you briefly tell us what plaque psoriasis is and the symptoms involved? Good morning. Yeah, so plaque psoriasis, it's a chronic autoimmune condition that leads to chronic inflammation in the skin. And common areas that are affected include your scalp, elbows, and knees, but even the nails and skin folds. And we know symptoms can range from itching, which is the most common, but also burning as well as soreness, especially when your skin starts to crack and bleed, which we typically see on the hands and feet. And pretty much all age groups are affected. You could be young, you could be old, as well as all skin tones. And so if you are more fairly complected, psoriasis can often look more light pink to red and scaly. Whereas if you have more color in your skin, it can look more purplish gray or even hyperpigmented. And then for many of our patients, winter is a tough time. Psoriasis does tend to flare because it gets drier, colder, lack of sun. These are all known triggers for psoriasis. I appreciate you informing us about this. Um, I, I want to ask Marjorie uh, for a minute. If, if you can, Marjorie, um, tell me about your personal journey and how the disease has affected you. Well, I, be, I have had psoriasis for four years now, and it greatly impacts me because my psoriasis is on the palms of my hands, mostly, and on the tops of my hands. So the things that I love to do most are baking and cooking, and I have to wear a latex gloves so that I can continue to do that as much as I like to. And come springtime, I'll be wearing my gardening gloves all the time while I'm outside in the garden because uh, it doesn't matter if it's a small job or a big job. It's, I have to, it's the fact that I have to keep my hands protected. But I think the most important thing for me is going up to someone I'm meeting for the first time and offering my hand in a handshake and knowing that my skin is very dry, sometimes scaly, and that this person can feel that. It's embarrassing. Marjorie, I, I appreciate you opening up uh, to us uh, about your personal journey. Um, I wanna go back over to, to Dr. Song for a minute. Um, and if you could tell me, uh, doctor, what's the cause of plaque psoriasis and you know, what's the difference between that and eczema and, and maybe the common uh, misconceptions of it? Yeah, so there's a lot of misconceptions, Andrew, one of which you mentioned that this is eczema, right, which is a different entity. It's due to a different part of the immune system. It, it presents differently as well. But also, is this infectious? Is this contagious? And, and those are not, any of those are right. It's actually due to chronic inflammation of your skin from your overactive immune system. And that's why Margie and I are here actually on behalf of Amgen, because we want to dispel some of those misconceptions and raise awareness that this is due to an overactive immune system that makes your skin cells grow much more rapidly than they should. And that's why it looks red, thick, and scaly. Is an overactive immune system, is that a good thing? It's, you know, there's, there's checks and balances to everything. If you get sick, of course, we want your, infection, your immune system to turn on so that it could address that infection. But once that infection or whatever trigger is gone, your immune system needs to turn off. And if it doesn't, then it starts to cause damage to parts of your body, including the skin. I see. Okay. Um, well, uh, doctor, let me, uh, let me ask you one more thing. How, how can people with plaque psoriasis manage their symptoms and, and I understand that it is a, a much bigger deal in the winter months. 
Yeah, so in the winter months, like you mentioned, it could flare. And so we want to make sure basic things like lukewarm baths, using a gentle cleanser, and using a moisturizer that's compatible with their skin on a regular basis. A lot of people are using topical medications like creams or ointments, and they may temporarily relieve some of the symptoms, but they oftentimes are greasy, they're messy, they're hard to do consistently, and they're not actually treating a root cause of that inflammation. And so my recommendation is if your topicals are not enough, talk with your dermatologist and see if an oral option might be a better option. Marjorie, we have thousands of people who watch us here on the Action News 5 digital desk, and perhaps some of them may have plaque psoriasis. What would you tell them? I would tell them the first time you see, <clears throat> excuse me, the first time you see something on your skin that is unusual, and if the itching is unbearable, make sure if you don't see your primary doctor, see a dermatologist and they can tell you if you have eczema or whatever it might be causing your problem or psoriasis and then work with that dermatologist to get to a, um, a good spot for yourself. Okay, uh, Dr. Song, uh, where can people go online for information about plaque psoriasis? Yeah, one recommendation here is it's a trusted source, www.the letter P, something different, so all one word, dot com. Some additional information on psoriasis as well as alternative treatment options that could be available for everyone. All right, Dr. James Song and Marjorie, we appreciate your time this morning. Uh, thanks so very much. Uh, for illuminating us to this issue. We appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. The U.S. only makes up about 4.4% of the world's population, but it consumes 80% of the world's opioids. Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse in partnership with Aleve have launched a campaign. It's called The Painful Truth, and it encourages consumers to explore non-addictive pain relief options with their doctor before considering opioids. Now, joining us to discuss this very important, important issue, because we all know the op opioid epidemic has done a number on us here in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. I'm joined now by Mary Bono, former congresswoman and co-founder of uh, the uh, Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse. Also joined now by Matt Robinson, a voice from the Painful Truth campaign. Good morning to you both. Um, Mary, let's begin with you and, and tell me about how this initiative first began. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this initiative began by us wanting to educate the American public about something like, you know, approximately every 30 minutes in the United States, we lose somebody to a prescription opioid overdose. And we want people to understand that the use of opioids carries some significant risks like addiction, abuse, or potential loss of life. Also important to know that for some reason, more opioids are prescribed in the United States than anywhere in the entire world. It's also important for people to know if they do take a prescription opioid to manage pain, there is a possibility that they could become addicted. Yeah, there's so many parts in this country uh, that have been ravaged by the opioid epidemic. and. 
Uh, no question, our area here in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas certainly has felt the brunt of that opioid epidemic. Matt, over to you. Um, can you share with us your first-hand experience um, with opioids? Yeah, you bet. I was first introduced to prescription opioids after an injury. I was a football player, um, big in Tennessee, Arkansas. I'm in Texas, so all boys play football, and I broke my leg, first introduced to, um, to the drug then. And I was always getting hurt. I had subsequent injuries, back injuries, things like that. And I was treating pain in the beginning, but at some point I wasn't just treating pain anymore. I was chasing an addiction. When I stopped taking the medication, I would, get into, I would go into severe withdrawal. Um, I'd get really sick if I didn't have it. And then uh, so you become everything you swore you'd never be. You're looking in the mirror, you don't recognize the person looking back at you, and you're completely lost. I appreciate you opening up and, and sharing with us here on the digital desk. And unfortunately, that story and your story is so common and so prevalent in so many different communities across America. Um, Mary, um, back over to you. Tell me what Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse is doing right now to address this issue that is hurting so many parts of our country. Well, we've been focused on drug abuse prevention and awareness for over a decade now. But right now, this campaign, we're especially pleased to be presenting. It is, again, this topic, and it is how do we take ownership of our own pain management. We're trying to encourage people to understand the potential consequences of prescription opioids. And we're just telling people, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your healthcare practitioner. If you need some pain management medication, have a conversation if there are alternatives to addictive opioids. We're really pleased that Matt is the star of this film. He has lived experience and he resonates with people as they're seeking their own pain management journey on what they ought to do. And it's a cautionary tale. And again, it comes back to this can happen to anyone. Yeah, no question. Uh, this affects everybody, uh, regardless of socioeconomic background. Um, Mary and Matt, uh, uh, this next question is for you. And Mary, we can begin with you. How can patients choose and advocate uh, for pain-related management that is non-addictive, non-opioid based? Well, Andrew, if you said so well, too, is, is there's no denying any longer that there is a crisis in America, a crisis of addiction, you know, and it's beyond just prescription drugs. But we are focused on what a patient can do. Again, talking to their doctor. We're very lucky that in this day and age, there are some great, very effective alternatives. Some are over the counter or some are sort of more of uh, assist other sort of therapies. But there are options out there, and I think we're trying to raise that awareness that patients should simply have that conversation with a doctor about what are my options to keep me off of potentially addictive uh, prescription opioids. Matt, over to you. Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. Mary said it there. It's, the name of the game is to discuss options. Um, when I was going through this, personally, I... It, it, there wasn't even a conversation about this. I was given a prescription and I filled it. I didn't think much about it. Um, if I had to talk to someone today, I would tell them to discuss their options because what happened to me could happen to anybody. You know, addiction doesn't discriminate. And most people that fall into this trap that I fell into are just trying to treat pain. We're not trying to get high. We're not trying to become addicts. No one signs up for this life. But it's a real possibility with these, with these drugs, with these medications. So the name of the game is options. Let's talk about what other options are out there, whether they're over-the-counter or holistic methods of treatment um, that aren't going to result in a decade of addiction like I went through. Well, Matt and Mary, thank you so much for coming on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. We have thousands of people uh, watching each and every morning here. Um, final thoughts and ways that people can maybe find some more information about this campaign online. Mary? Well, we'd love for you to join us at Aleve.com slash The Painful Truth. Anything else, Matt? No, thanks for having us. This is a really important message to get out there. And it's, it's an honor, I can speak for Mary as well, uh, to be here and discuss this. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, Matt, to, uh, to come up and, and tell your story. And, and Mary, thank you for all that you do. And, and we appreciate both of you uh, taking the courage and the fight uh, against opioids, uh, not only uh, where you are and where you guys live, but across this country. And certainly, um, we need all the help we can get. Thank you both.
Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas, and right now is one of the more enjoyable moments. In fact, it is the most enjoyable moment, especially on a Tuesday. We have Talisa Franklin joining us from The Trend, and Talisa is always so good about giving us uh, some positive news in Memphis and the Mid-South, positive events that are happening. Uh, I first want to ask, uh, Talisa, did you watch the, the total eclipse? How was it for you? Let me tell you, it was amazing. And I had an opportunity. I was at uh, with Director Brian Harris for Employee, working on some things for our amazing, incredible youth here in our city of Memphis. And we were outside watching the eclipse. I was like, oh my God. What are we watching? And it was for me when 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 the, the clouds got, I was like, it looks like it's like going to pour down rain and you put your glasses on and you see the eclipse. I was like, oh my God, thank you, Lord. I'm able to witness this. It was amazing. I pray you yeah, watched I, it. I pray you witnessed it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty wild. Um, and you know, we had Patrick Ellis in Little Rock, Arkansas on the path of totality. We were live on the air here at the digital desk and he got emotional on air because it was just so intense for him. I mean, he was in a crowd of thousands at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and there were cheers going. It sounded like it was a concert, and everyone was just so happy about it. Uh, but, you know, hey, I'm glad everyone experienced it. We'll all remember where we were during that time. What you got going on this weekend? I know we got enough, more positive events happening in Talisa Franklin's world. Let's spread the love. Absolutely, because if it's not positivity, I don't want to be a part of it. And that's right. Listen, today, y'all, you know, I believe that affordable health care for all. And so today I'm excited that the Dwelling Place Church Memphis and Sin Relief Memphis is hosting a Memphis Raleigh Memphis Health and Wellness Fair. And so, listen, this is such a blessing in the community. It start, It's today, y'all, from 8 o'clock to 2 p.m. I'm actually headed there to get me some of those great services like mammogram. Ladies, we got to make sure we get those tatas checked on, right? Uh, but health and wellness, there's so many health and wellness partners that they have there so that we can get those essential things that we need. And so if you're out in the area or you're not in the area, you have until 2 o'clock today to get to the Dwelling Place Church 3034 Old Austin P. Highway, right here in the city of Memphis for their health and wellness fair. Listen, it's going to be a great event. I'm excited to take advantage of all the health and wealth services that's taking place at that health fair today. And I invite you all out as well. And let's take totally advantage of the health fair ideas uh, that's going on today at Raleigh Memphis Health and Wellness Fair uh, at the Dwelling Place. And then on this weekend, you know, it's nothing like we take care of our community. We take care of our city. We take care of the people that are in need. And so there is a mobile food pantry that is happening in the Douglas community, y'all. I want to say shout out to Kathy Temple. Uh, she leads this effort. Uh, the time is now. They're doing such an incredible job in the community. Uh, the mobile food pantry is this Saturday, y'all. Listen, you don't have to get out your car. There is so many volunteers, so many team players that are saying we want to help. Listen, thank God for the Memphis Food Bank. All you have to do is bring your driver's license or state issued ID and be prepared to fill out a little information, right? And then the food starts at 10 until it's gone. Let me tell you, it's always a great time of giving out great things and great food uh, to our community. So this Saturday, y'all, in the Douglas Park behind the Douglas High School, you can come out in the mobile food pantry, get in the line like so many others that are blessed uh, in these food pantries across our city and allow the time is now uh, uh, Center for Transforming Communities and the Memphis Food Bank, all that great partnership. Again, shout out to Kathy Temple that makes sure that they have something very nice for our community. And so ha that happens. And then y'all know I'm all about how do we mentor young ladies and see our young ladies be the best version of themselves. Well, I want to shout out to Director Vanessa Caswell, y'all. Let me tell you, she is a lady that really, truly loves young ladies. And so she, she leads the I Am She 
girls mentoring group. And so listen, she's having a mentoring information session. So are you interested in being a mentor? Do you know that you have something that you can help another young lady, not just survive, but thrive? Listen, she is inviting you out this Saturday from 10 o'clock to 12 p.m. at 1330 Union Avenue, Suite 936, for you to come out and learn a little bit more about I Am She mentoring uh, information session because you may be that young lady that you need to speak life into that little young version of you that can help her thrive in this community. And so let's definitely shout out to Director Caswell Rogers that is doing a great work in our community and helping our young ladies just not survive, but she's making sure they thrive in this community. And so I'm telling y'all that some great things happening. Today, the health and wellness is happening in the Raleigh area. And on Saturday, the mobile food pantry and I am she. And then I always tell you, baby, do something that you love that brings joy to your life. So Andrew, it's going to be a great, great week in the Bluff City, I must say. No question about it. I love hearing it each and every week. Talisa, thank you so much and appreciate you spreading that positivity all across Memphis and the Mid-South. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you, my brother. Have a great week. Okay. You do the same. Thank you. Another look from our High Five camera uh, in Midtown Memphis. Some clouds out there. 61 degrees, 804. We're talking about your forecast in 60 seconds. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. My friends, a first alert to heavy rainfall potential here over the course of the next couple of days. It starts today. As you're heading out the door, you'll need the umbrellas, the rain jackets all day long. Temperatures hovering in the 60s and of course, rain will come in waves, so it may not rain constantly, but it may be raining persistently over the next couple of days. Of course, the midweek impact heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. And this is something that we got to keep in the back of our mind. Water rises from our creeks, tributaries, main stem rivers, as well as uh, some of the storage uh, areas, uh, say Sardis Lake, uh, Grenada Lake, and Enid Lake. Uh, that's something that we'll be watching here the next couple of days because, of course, the water is going to start to come up. That's going to start to flow down a stream and eventually make its way down towards the Mississippi, uh, the uh, Yazoo River backwater as they have to discharge some of that water, not to mention uh, we've got water coming down the Mississippi that's going to have some big rises probably here, not to the point to where we're talking big flooding, but definitely noticeable considering that it has been so dry as late. Remember, we were dealing with a huge deficit along the Mississippi River back a couple of months ago, and now we're back to almost full capacity along the river as we approach a minor flood stage here soon enough. Here's a look at what we got going on as far as the rainfall is concerned. Again, it's not just here. You got to think about what's going on upstream as well. Some upstream water rises are expected along the Ohio and uh, Missis Mississippi River Valleys and also for our Tennessee River Valley folks as well. That's going to start heading down towards uh, across this area, and it's going to be a very messy go of things here in the next few days. Heavy rainfall. You see the red areas. Those are three plus inches of rainfall, and some spots could be even higher than that. I will say it's looking more likely that we'll have some pockets here in North Mississippi where we will probably be approaching by the time we get towards Thursday three to five inches. I think most spots though, uh, especially north of I-41 to three 
and then two to four is a general rule south, but there will be some pockets of five inches of rain, not out of the realm of possibility. Now, when you look at this again, this is where the flooding potential will likely be again across the Mississippi uh, Delta into south southern portions of Arkansas, and northern Louisiana, down towards about Jackson, Mississippi. Tomorrow, the moderate risk for flooding goes a little farther to the east. Here in Memphis and across the mid south, we're underneath a slight risk for flooding the entire next two days. That's more so low lying, poor drainage, flooding, flooding. Uh, so that's something that we'll be watching as well that may slow you down. In addition to the rainfall, the potential for an isolated strong storm or two now, the realm of possibility later on today here in uh, portions of East Central Arkansas, and Northwest Mississippi. And also tomorrow, a little better chance, but even that not the worst looking scenario playing out. I think wind and hail the primary issue for us, uh, but the farther south that you go, you see this red area that's a moderate risk for severe weather and it does look like uh, damaging winds tornado risk also in play here. Jackson, Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, down towards Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian and the farther north that you go, you start losing the instability, but still plenty of moisture to work with and enough that we could feature a risk for a few stronger storms. Thursday, a quieter day from the standpoint of severe weather and flooding, but still some rain in play. Let's go with our first alert future cast again, some showers and storms. There might be one or two gusty ones making their way across portions of North Mississippi late this afternoon and that will shift out of here. The thing is that we'll go into a relative lull in the activity. Rain showers pretty light as we get closer to uh, five, six o'clock. There's another wave that moves across portions of Mississippi that will shoot northward some rain opportunities. A little bit of a lull tomorrow morning. Another wave of rain and storms, maybe a gusty storm or two as we get towards your Wednesday late morning, early afternoon. Re relative lull in the activity late afternoon into the early evening. More rain moving through here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday, and that will be about the last part of the heavy rain aspect. We may need to up the rain chance on Thursday uh, to cover the lingering effects of the rain that will be pushing across the mid south. Temperatures in the 60s to near 70 overnights in the 60s and 50s. The rain will start to taper off, but as we go through Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to start to kick up 30 35 mile per hour wind gusts on Wednesday, 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts come Thursday. We'll still still say breezy on Friday with a high near 70. We'll go upper 70s as we get closer to the upcoming weekend with a chance for a few showers to return by Monday of next week. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. How many times do you use your phone? You know, like every week it'll tell you, you used your phone for seven hours or eight hours or more. We use this phone all the time, and that can really cause uh, some problems. Mentally, it can cause some problems physically, too, because you're not going around and doing any kind of physical activity or talking with people. And so now there is this thought of maybe having some tech free detox zones out there. Let's bring in uh, a frequent guest here to the Action News 5 Digital Desk, Dr. Laura Schultz, Methodist Labonner Healthcare. She's also Senior Director of Behavioral Health. Um, Dr. Schultz, thank you so much for returning on the Digital Desk. Tell us where we are when it comes to our phones and how detrimental it is to our mental health. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you nailed it. I think the average American is spending around seven hours a day looking at screen. And while much of that might be, uh, you know, accounted for by our work requirements, staring at the computer, 
Um, we're also on our phones a lot, and that's the place where we could really start to make some difference if we chose to. Our children are spending like over seven hours a day on their screens as well, which if you look at that pre-pandemic, they were averaging around 3.8 hours a day. So they've really seen the greatest increase. And it does have an impact on our physical health, our mental health, our sleep goes down, we're not as active, we're not as engaged with the people around us. So sometimes it can be really good to give ourselves a break in the day from that screen time. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's too much. And, um, you know, I, I know that with my kids, I have kids that are um, in college right now, when they were in high school, we always had to put limits on their phone and their phone use. Um, we just found it they were better at responding to us, uh, interacting with others when we put those limits. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much uh, mental health is affected by these phones. So tell me about this idea of like tech-free detox zones. Well, you know, I think it's just good to, we set limits as parents all the time Sometimes we're not as good at setting limits on ourselves, but boundaries are helpful and we can set those for ourselves physically and emotionally and we can set them regarding our phones. So one of the ideas is creating areas of your home that are just tech free, places where you can actually relax and unwind. I think many of us during the pandemic started working remotely, at least part time, and that means work follows us home a lot. And everyone thinks we should all be accessible all the time, but what if we had certain areas of our home where we could really just unplug, truly be present with those around us and truly start to get some time relaxing? So that's the idea of creating some boundaries within your home in these specific areas that might just be tech free places where you can relax and connect with those around you. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So um, so let's continue on. Let's talk about um, some of the areas of the house where we should be tech free. comes to mind for me is that kitchen table or dining room table, wherever it is that you are having meals with those around you. Uh, one of the things that we know is when we're on our screens, we're not as mindful or present with the people around us or with what we're doing immediately in front of us. And so what we see is people who are on their screens a lot tend to have a tendency to gain weight, eat less healthy foods. So if you were to put the phones away, the TV off, and just be mindful and fully present of what you're eating, you're going to enjoy the food more. It's going to taste better because you're actually attending to the taste and the texture of the food. You're also going to be more aware of how much you're eating and what you're eating. So mindful eating is something that we do a lot. We recommend that for folks who are trying to lose weight or be healthier. Just be fully present with your food, but also around that kitchen table or that dining room table, connections and community can happen. A lot of times for most of us, if we do have a partner or children in the home or friends gathering, those are our most important people sitting around that table. And so it's an opportunity for us to look them in the eye and engage, recognize those uh, nonverbals that we might miss if we're just texting all day and really connect with those people. So I think both for enjoying the food, for our weight, for our health, and for our emotional and social well-being, the kitchen table is a great place to start. Another place that I really think is wonderful to make a tech-free zone is our bedroom. So the bedroom really, we want it to become a sanctuary. We want that to be a place where we get high quality sleep, and screens are kind of the opposite of what would lead to high quality sleep. The blue lights reduce the melatonin that our brain produces, which is what leads to good quality sleep. Um, and also the content of what we're staring at on our screens can be pretty emotionally stimulating. Uh, we're watching the news, we're engaging with social media, comparison between ourselves and others on social media can lead to that anxiety and feeling sadness, and that's never good right before you try to relax and go to bed. Um, so making sure that bedroom is a place where you can relax and keeping the, the phones and the screens out can be really helpful. And then a third area of the home that I think we should really try to create as a tech-free zone is whatever our best outdoor space is. So it could be your backyard, your front patio, if you have some sort of a screened-in porch. Uh, 
the green space we know is really good for activating our parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us relax and unwind. But we miss that if we're staring at a screen. Same thing with getting that increased vitamin D and serotonin boost that comes with being outside. We're just, we're kind of stealing our own joy if we're staring at a screen in that relaxing outdoor space. So those three areas of the home for me would be top places that I would want to put on delay. I love it. I, those are great areas where people can start and really kind of uh, detox, uh, no question about it. And what's interesting is I would think it, it won't take long for people to immediately see a difference, right? I think so. You know, 57% of us feel like we're addicted to our phones. And we're picking up our phones in 2023. The, the research showed us that the average American is picking up their phone 144 times a day. So I think if you were to start creating some detox zones, there could be an initial kind of increased anxiety of, oh my gosh, where's my phone? What am I missing? But what we'll find is that over time, that anxiety is going to start to come down, and then we can start to realize who we are apart from this digital device. And I do think over not very long, you'll start to experience that sense of relaxation of not having to be responsible to all of the things that come into your phone at any given point, uh, whether those be work, requirements from families and friends, um, all the social media pressure to check those likes or see who's connecting with you, but to just be present in the world and in the life with the people that we have around us. It's really wonderful, and I, I do recommend people just start trying it and seeing if they start to notice their anxiety come down and their mood go up. Great recommendations, Dr. Laura Schultz, Methodist Lavonner Healthcare Senior Director of Behavioral Health. We appreciate you every time you come on the digital desk. Thanks very much. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Have you often wondered, especially this time of season, is it allergies or am I really sick? You know, allergies get worse as we age, and sometimes it's really difficult to really kind of differentiate between the two. Let's bring in someone to really kind of help us in this question and answer some questions. I'm joined now by Dr. Kendra Shepard. Uh, an MD with Dedicated Care Senior Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Shepard, thanks for joining us. Uh, where, where do we begin on that? Because I know a lot of people, especially here in the Memphis area, a lot of people suffer from seasonal allergies. How do we determine really quickly if it's allergies or if it's a sickness? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me again. And yes, um, allergies, we call it allergic rhinitis and hay fever. It's so common. One in four um, adults and one in five children have allergies. And the way we usually tell, you know, the normal symptoms are that runny nose, the itchy eyes, itchy ears, that post nasal drip where you're going <clears throat> in the back of your throat. Those are all common with allergies. However, if it's sickness, such as a virus, most of the time you'll have a fever or a very sore throat as opposed to a scratchy throat. And those are the times where you want to sort of contact your doctor to see if you need to be screened for viruses like flu or COVID. 
Gotcha. And, you know, as I mentioned off the top, Dr. Shepard, um, you know, as we age, uh, allergies get more severe. I didn't know that. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about some of the reasons behind that? Yeah, and, and aging is a process. And so all of us, when we age, our cells age, even our immune system, immune system ages. So as we get older, the allergies tend to get worse because we, our immune system is not working as well as it did um, in our younger years. And so we, with the season lasting longer, um, we just want to be able to do as much preventing, making sure they avoid the triggers, making sure they stay out of the pollen um, to prevent um, the allergies or at least reduce the allergies so that they won't get sicker. Yeah, I, you know, in Memphis and, and the Mid-South, I mean, we, we have the tree pollen, uh, grass yes. pollen, uh, and it just makes people go crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there ways, um, let's, let's, let's hear some of the ways, the best ways, preventative methods to really kind of yeah. at least maybe not stop allergies altogether, but at least kind of reduce some right. of those symptoms. Yes. So, of course, we want to avoid the pollen, right? We can't avoid it when we go outside. It's covering our car, you know, and it's outside. But once we come back in, what we want to do is take our clothes off, uh, remove our shoes, shower at night, sort of shower before you go into the bedroom. You don't want it in your um in your bedroom. Um, when you are out, it's optional, but you can wear a mask to reduce the risk and goggle like glasses to kind of keep it out of your eyes. Those are ways to avoid the pollen. It's inconvenient because we get a little hot and sticky, you know, um, and so you want to do that. And then um, another step for people who have really kind of moderate to severe allergies Saline nasal sprays, sprays are really good. So rinsing out your nose with a, a saline solution and sort of getting all that gunk out preventively um, before you use your over-the-counter allergy medicines really, really helps uh, in um, preventing or at least decreasing um, our reactions to allergies. The, these are some great tips, easy to understand and easy to uh, to implement today. Um, anything else before yeah. we let you go, um, Dr. Shepard, that we can touch on you feel is important about this? Well, I, I want to touch on, I want to make sure that people are talking to their doctor about allergies, going to a trusted source. Here at Dedicated, we ask people to come in all the time. And I say that because we want to make sure it's allergies and not a virus, you know, and sometimes people can't tell. And so we commonly test for flu and COVID regularly. And we do that because we have medicine for it, right? And so uh, sometimes when you're like, okay, well, it's allergies, or you're someone who doesn't normally get triggered by pollen, that's a time to come in and say, hey, I just want to make sure uh, you know, everything is going okay. So make sure you have a doctor you trust, come on in, get tested, flu or COVID, get that reassurance, um, and also get those medicines to help mitigate um, that allergic rhinitis or those signs of allergies. All right, Dr. Kendra Shepard, we appreciate your time this Thank morning. You. Great conversation, and I know it helped yes. uh, a number of different people out there. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. My friends, a first alert to heavy rainfall potential here over the course of the next couple of days. It starts today. As you're heading out the door, you'll need the umbrellas, the rain jackets all day long. Temperatures hovering in the 60s and of course rain will come in waves, so it may not rain constantly, but it may be raining persistently over the next couple of days. Of course, the midweek impact heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. And this is something that we got to keep in the back of our mind. Water rises from our creeks, tributaries, main stem rivers as well as uh, some of the storage uh, areas, uh, say Sardis Lake, uh, Grenada Lake and Enid Lake. Uh, that's something that we'll be watching here the next couple of days because, of course, the water is going to start to come up. That's going to start to flow down a stream and eventually make its way down towards the Mississippi. Uh, the uh, Yazoo River backwater as they have to discharge some of that water, not to mention uh, we've got water coming down the Mississippi that's going to have some big rises probably here, not to the point to where we're talking big flooding, but definitely noticeable considering that it has been so dry as of late. Remember, we were dealing with a huge deficit along the Mississippi River back a couple of months ago, and now we're back to almost full capacity along the river as we approach a minor flood stage here soon enough. Here's a look at what we got going on as far as the rainfall is concerned. Again, it's not just here. You got to think about what's going on upstream as well. Some upstream water rises are expected along the Ohio and uh, Missis Mississippi River Valleys and also for our Tennessee River Valley folks as well. That's going to start heading down towards uh, across this area and it's going to be a very messy go of things here in the next few days. Heavy rainfall. You see the red areas. Those are three plus inches of rainfall and some spots could be even higher than that. I will say it's looking more likely that we'll have some pockets here in North Mississippi where we will probably be approaching by the time we get towards Thursday three to five inches. I think most spots though, uh, especially north of I 41 to three and then two to four is a general rule south, but there will be some pockets of five inches of rain, not out of the realm of possibility. Now, when you look at this again, this is where the flooding potential would like to be again across the Mississippi uh, Delta into south southern portions of Arkansas, northern Louisiana, down towards about Jackson, Mississippi. Tomorrow, the moderate risk for flooding goes a little farther to the east here in Memphis and across the mid south. We're underneath a slight risk for flooding the entire next two days. That's more so low lying, poor drainage, flooding, flooding. Uh, so that's something that we'll be watching as well. That may slow you down. In addition to the rainfall, the potential for an isolated strong storm or two Nile, the realm of possibility later on today here in uh, portions of East Central Arkansas, Northwest Mississippi. And also tomorrow, a little better chance, but even that not the worst looking scenario playing out. I think wind and hail the primary issue for us, uh, but the farther south that you go, you see this red area that's a moderate risk for severe weather and it does look like uh, damaging winds tornado risk also in play here. Jackson, Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, down towards Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian and the farther north that you go, you start losing the instability, but still plenty of moisture to work with and enough that we could feature a risk for a few stronger storms. Thursday, a quieter day from the standpoint of severe weather and flooding, but still some rain in play. Let's go with our first alert future cast again, some showers and storms. There might be one or two gusty ones making their way across portions of North Mississippi late this afternoon and that will shift out of here. The thing is that we'll go into a relative lull in the activity. Rain showers pretty light as we get closer to uh, five, six o'clock. There's another wave that moves across portions of Mississippi that will shoot northward some rain opportunities. A little bit of a lull tomorrow morning. Another wave of rain and storms, maybe a gusty storm or two as we get towards your Wednesday late morning, early afternoon. Re a relative lull in the activity late afternoon into the early evening. More rain moving through here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday, and that will be about the last part of the heavy rain aspect. We may need to up the rain chance on Thursday uh, to cover the lingering effects of the rain that will be pushing across the mid south. Temperatures in the 60s to near 70 overnights in the 60s and 50s. The rain will start to taper off, but as we go through Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to start to kick up 30 35 mile per hour wind gusts on Wednesday, 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts come Thursday. We'll still still say breezy on Friday. The high near 70 will go upper 70s as we get closer to the upcoming weekend with a chance for a few showers to return by Monday of next week.
Okay, Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. There has been a new book released, and I'm holding it right now. It's called Raising Mentally Strong Kids, How to Combine the Power of Neuroscience with Love and Logic to Grow Confident, Kind, Responsible, and Resilient Children and Young Adults. We all want this for our kids, for our grandkids, in this ever-changing and very challenging world. I am joined on the digital desk and really honored to be joined by Dr. Daniel Amen. He is someone I've been seeing on social media for years and years and years. I've heard him on podcasts. I've read a lot of his stuff, especially the brain scan. So fascinated by this. He is one of the co-authors of this book. And it is a book that certainly is relevant today. In fact, Dr. Amen has written 18 books on the New York Times bestseller list. He joins us now on the digital desk. Big fan, Dr. Amen. How are you this morning? Thank you so much. I am just so grateful to uh, share this message with you. I appreciate you being here. So tell me why th you wrote this book and why it's so critical right now. Well, kids are in historic trouble. A uh, brand new study from the CDC that said 57% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 24% have planned to kill themselves. I mean, think about that. 13% have actually tried. These are statistics never seen before in recorded history. Why? Uh, from the rise in social media to the pandemic that changed all of our brains, uh, to the low quality food, to the toxic products we put on children's bodies, our own bodies, we need a different way. And I partnered with my friend, Dr. Charles Fay, the president of the Love and Logic Institute, one of the best parenting programs ever developed. Uh, and the reason we put that together is there's no neuroscience, there's no brain science in parenting with love and logic. And we decided raising mentally strong kids needed to have a foundation of neuroscience with the wonderful uh, parenting with love and logic program. Dr. Amen, you're one of the top neuropsychiatrists in the country and you have a brain scan um, that you've patented. I've, I've heard you talk about it so many times before. In fact, my wife and I would share with our kids what a brain looks like when they are um, on drugs or um, a, a daily, uh, a, a person who uh, smokes marijuana on a daily basis or has a drink every day versus a brain scan of someone healthy. Is that are those factors contributing to the kind of issues you just mentioned where, um, you know, people are just, their brains are on fire, right? But very few people, I mean, thank you for that question. Very few people love and care for their brains. And 33 years ago, now I started looking at the brain. And as a psychiatrist, you know, most psychiatrists never look at the brain. And I'm like, oh my goodness, these are not mental health problems, they're brain health problems. What do I need to do to get my brain healthy and the brains of my babies and children healthy? And it just, it changes the whole conversation uh, rather than you need to take this or that medicine for your mental health problems, you need to get your brain healthy. And that means you need to sleep, you need to eat right, you need to exercise. Here are some simple supplements. And we have a poster that hangs in over 100,000 schools and prisons and churches called Which Brain Do You Want? Healthy scans surrounded by drug-affected scans. And you realize marijuana is not innocuous and alcohol is not a health food. We need to be really clear, but if you understand societal messages, oh, marijuana is innocuous, it's a lie. Teenagers who use marijuana have an increased risk of anxiety, depression, and suicide in their 20s. Um, we need to give accurate, 
positive, hopeful messages to our children. Thank you for saying that. I, I feel like uh, you're um, one of the voices that is very consistent about saying those kind of things, those detrimental effects that marijuana has. I just wish more people um, with your type of background would uh, speak up about that issue because it's certainly a prevalent issue and it seems more prevalent year after year. Um, so you've written this book, back to the book here, which I have a copy of. Uh, you sent it to us. Thank you very much. The one message you want parents and grandparents, for that matter, to take away from this book. You want to raise mentally strong kids, and who among us doesn't? I'm a father of six. You have to model the message. So it really does start with you. If mental strength, knowing what you want, being able to persistently act in positive ways to get it over time, not believing every stupid thing you think, we call it killing the ants, absolutely essential that parents model it and in that way because children do what you do not what you tell them to do and so this book will help you but it'll also help you be the best dad or the best mom uh, the best grandma the best grandpa that you can be Dr. Amen, can you give us an example, perhaps, of, of a powerful exercise um, from that book? You, you know, my favorite exercise is start every day with your kids. Today is going to be a great day. Uh, and when you put them to bed at night, go, what went well today? And let's start at the beginning of your day and just let's go through the day looking at what was right. Positivity bias, getting your brain to look for what's right rather than what's wrong, protects you from virtually all of the mental health problems we're facing. I love it. I love it. Positivity is so valuable and so easy to do. It's just creating a different mindset. Um, Dr. Amen, I I also wanted to ask you, if someone wanted to get their brain scanned, I know that you have clinics all over the country. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe you have any here in Memphis or the Mid-South. How would someone go about getting their brain scanned just to kind of see if it's healthy or not? So our closest clinic, I think it's Atlanta, um, that they just have to go to amenclinics.com and fill out the intake form or call the number. And we would love to see them because, you know, the brain is the most important organ in the body, but very few people actually ever look at it. And so getting a look at how healthy your brain is and then getting a plan to optimize it is so special. Uh, for people. One final thing before we let you go, Dr. Amen. Um, how much of, of the brain health or the, the, the detrimental aspects of brain health can be contributed or can be, um, can be as a result looked at with this smartphone, that the, the smartphone technology that is constantly barraging uh, kids, teens everywhere? How much of a detrimental effect does that have in our brain? I think it's very large. Uh, they're dopamine dumping devices. Uh, so whenever you get a notification or an email you like, or you know, a TikTok video that makes you laugh, it's dumping a little bit of dopamine. The problem is we're wearing out the pleasure centers in the brain with these devices. We're getting into this dopamine deficit state which is why kids are bored, why they are um, distracted, uh, why they're sad. Uh, we've unleashed this technology on a whole population without any neuroscience research. The neuroscientists were used to hook, you know, okay, how do, how do we use neuroscience to get more mind share to basically hook their attention? take the devices away from them when kids go to bed. 
Now, you have to limit them, you have to put parental controls on them, but take them away from your children so they don't take them to bed. Amen. Dr. Amen, I uh, certainly appreciate that. That is, uh, that is well, well said. Um, we, I, I really miss your podcast, by the way. I enjoy it when you're on other podcasts. Um, but uh, for anyone out there that wants to see Dr. Amen and, and more of his content, you can do so on TikTok. He's got millions of followers, and you're posting stuff each and every day. Thanks so much for co uh, coming on the digital desk. We have thousands of people that watch each and every day, and I know uh, it's beneficial for so many of them. And, uh, and I appreciate you writing this book. Um, anything else before we let you go, Dr. Well, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. And, you know, people can get Raising Mentally Strong Kids anywhere. Great books are sold. It's just out this week. And uh, we're praying that it makes a big difference. Dr. Daniel Amen, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Well, life is full of transitions, aren't that, isn't it? I mean, you think about it throughout your life, no matter what season, big or small, we're constantly going through transitions. Some are planned, others are unexpected. No matter how they happen, it can be challenging for us. It could be anything from getting married, moving to a new house, a new job, um, thinking about retirement, going into retirement. So how do we handle this the best way possible? Let's bring in someone, an expert, who can really kind of help us with life's transition. I'm joined now by licensed professional counselor, Elizabeth Drain. She's with Methodist Labonner Healthcare to talk more about life's transitions and how to handle them. If you had the best piece of advice, Elizabeth, the, the number one piece of advice when people are going through transitions, what would it be first and foremost? Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Doing um, well, thank first, you. First, most importantly, I would like to say um, it's very important to understand that, you know, different transitions, uh, everyone handles differently, you know, depending on one's personality, coping mechanisms, support system, all of those things make a difference uh, in terms of how you handle uh, life transitions. However, I would like to discuss eight coping strategies uh, that can be implemented daily to assist you in navigating these challenges. Okay, so the first one I would say, accept change as a normal part of life. Transitions in life are the easiest for those who possess this attitude. Uh, I would also recommend identifying and express your feelings. While trying to push away feelings or fear and anxiety is normal, acknowledging them can help you get over them faster and make them real by writing them down and taking the time to reflect on them. You can reduce these influences over you yeah. by acknowledging and expressing these emotions. 
So, um, so let me ask you what you said off the first one, Elizabeth. Um, you mentioned uh, change is a normal part of life. You know, there's so many people out there that says, oh, I don't like change. I like doing what I'm doing right now. I don't want to change. Where is where do people have the most problems when it comes to transitions? Is it something that they're dealing with before they the transition, the thoughts in their head before actually doing it? Or is it something else? I would say it's probably a combination of, of all of those things. Uh, you know, we're most comfortable with things that we're familiar with. And so when life throws us uh, what I would call change or curveballs, things that we were not expecting, then it takes us out of our comfort zone. And so now we're having challenges uh, navigating you know, uh, the, the change because it's, it's unfamiliar to us. So absolutely. You know, I um, w I know you you mentioned eight coping strategies, and, and I want you to continue with that. But I, but I do want to have a little dialogue here because um, I find it I find it interesting that um, you're right. I mean, like we're all going through transitions. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mm -hmm. mean, it, you know, it, raising children, of course, and and buying a house, getting married, have, uh, you know, moving to a new city, starting a new job. I mean, it, everyone's going through that. And and you mentioned, you know, right after accepting the fact that there's going to be change in your life, um, identifying your feelings and expressing your feelings. I mean, it's it's so important to just you know understand why you're feeling the way that you feel, right? Absolutely. Uh, when you can understand and process how you're feeling, why you're feeling those uh, that way, then it makes it a little bit easier for you to cope or plan ahead uh, and problem solve around those feelings that, that you're having. Uh, and as I mentioned, writing those feelings down uh, gives you the opportunity to reflect on them. You know, oftentimes when, when we're thinking about uh, things, uh, we just reminisce o over and over and over and it just kind of stays stuck in our head. So when we put it on paper, it kind of makes things real and it, it gives us the opportunity to process what we're thinking and not just think about it. I totally agree. So, um, so continue on with your um, list of, of eight coping strategies. Okay, so the third one would be focus on the payoff. Consider the lesson, the lesson you have taken away from previous transitions. Recall the steps you took and what you learned and achieved at each stage, such as changes can offer, you know, useful time to self-reflect, learning to overcome fears and dealing with uncertainty. So just kind of thinking about the payoff, uh, you know, can be helpful as well. Uh, number I four, I would say uh, kind of what we have just spoke about, expect to be uncomfortable. You know, a time of transition can be confusing. Uh, it is a normal feeling to feel insecure and anxious, but these feelings are part of the process and they will pass. Absolutely. Uh, number five, I think it's a really big one. You know, stay sober. Uh, it is not a good idea to use alcohol or drugs at this difficult and confusing time. It might make things even more challenging. So I yeah. think it's very important uh, to manage, you know, your, your alcohol consumption or drug use during this time. Yeah, staying sober. Uh, I, I want to hit on that too because um, you know a lot of times people are so nervous, uh, they, they're you know concerned about the transition, wanting it to go so well. They're nervous. They might have a drink or two or three, and and suddenly you know they're they're not sober, and um, and so their their thinking is is you know a little bit off base. Uh, but staying sober so important in these. Um, critical transitions. I, I love that. And then, you know, expecting it to be uncomfortable. I always tell people, including my kids, I always tell them, hey, look, that first year of being in a new city, a new job, it, you know, give yourself some time because it's going to take a while. You're going to be uncomfortable. But 
if you just focus on the tasks at hand, focus on the payoff, like you said, um, it, mm -hmm. it's going to be okay. And staying summer, uh, sober and expect a little bit of uncomfortableness for a while, it, it'll, it'll come through in the end. But I'm enjoying these eight strategies. Uh, please continue. Okay, number six, uh, build your support system. You know, seek the uh, support of your friends, your family members. Um, transition period is a great opportunity to seek, to seek uh, a counselor's assistance. You know, and especially for someone that may have a limited uh, support system, you know, the counselor can definitely help guide them through the transition process in a safe and supportive environment. Uh, number seven, acknowledge what you are leaving behind. The first step toward accepting the new is accepting and letting go of the past to make room for the new. Um, and then number eight is, is normal to feel as though your life is out of control. Find one tiny thing you can control right now to help you feel more in control. Is there one aspect that you find people struggle with the most, Elizabeth? Um, I would say uh, managing their thoughts, you know, because our thoughts kind of drive every emotion, you know, feeling that we have. Uh, so I find that people struggle the most with managing uh, the thoughts that they're having, uh, which is why number eight is, is really, really important because if you narrow that focus uh, and focus on the thing that you can control or even narrow it down to one tiny thing, then it gives you more uh, of a sense of control over what's going on. You know, I, I love the list of eight. I, is there a place where people can find that list and maybe some other helpful hints online? Uh, well, yes. Uh, go to the Methodist uh, EAP uh, website and all of our uh, newsletters are on there. This was uh, this month's newsletter. So they'll be able to access this information on there. Okay, and what is the uh, what is the web address? Methodist Healthcare Employee Assistance Program. Dot org. Okay, okay, so MethodistHealth.org. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Well, listen, uh, Elizabeth Drain, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, laying it out for us, uh, some of the issues that some people have when it comes to um, getting through those transitions in life. I think it really helped people to just kind of talk about it and let people know that, hey, this is a part of life. This is something that everyone goes through, and um, here's a way to handle it effectively. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Did you know that some people who have really bad allergies throughout the year, they go to an acupuncturist for treatment? 
this is a thing is certainly we know about allergies here in Memphis of the Mid-South. So many people suffer from it. Well, now this treatment is helping a lot of people out there. Let's bring in Jessica Puckett. Uh, she's an acupuncturist in Memphis, and she is someone that does this procedure. Jessica, good morning. Um, tell me first off um, the idea behind this where acupuncture helps people, uh, especially those allergy sufferers. Good morning. Good morning. Um, acupuncture is um, a 5,000-year-old procedure. Um, it's been around for, for many millennia. Um, <clears throat> however, we have honed in through research over the past few decades on how it actually works. And we have discovered there are really intricate connections in the ear that um, connect with the brain and how your body responds to your stimuli around you. So this procedure that we utilize for allergies is called the SAT, S-A-A-T, um, auricular acupuncture treatment for allergies. And it's very effective, about 80 to 95% effective in the way your body responds to different allergens. That's, uh, that's pretty fantastic. Um, and my understanding is that you are uh, the only practitioner in Memphis doing this type of treatment. Is that in fact the case? And, and tell me why others aren't doing this. Well, it is um, a fairly new protocol that we're using. Um, I actually went to train with Dr. Nadir Solomon, who is the um, founder of this particular protocol for allergies. And I got my certification through him. Um, in fact, he's, I'm going back to train with him for more with some clinical, um, clinical training to get deeper into uh, research and studies. But um, it has recently become known specifically for treating alpha-gal, which is the red meat allergy that you receive from a tick bite. Um, and, and it's very effective for that. So that is what it's become more popularized for. It, it's, the word is spreading for that treatment. However, we can treat any type of allergens, you know, environmental, <clears throat> food, toxic um, exposures, and things like that. So um, that, it's very fascinating to me. Um, so this is, the procedure is uh, referred to as S-A-A-T. Um, so uh, how many treatments have you done? And um, are these people that are, you know, really uh, big allergy sufferers? Or are they just kind of moderate? And, 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 and give me the before and after. Well, we can treat anything from... Um, from just slight sensitivities up to anaphylactic shock. The way it, we're not, you know, just like most things in medicine, you can't really say you're curing. You're just desensitizing the body from the reactions that, that you um, portray as you are exposed to those allergens. Um, I've done many, many, many treatments. I can't even count how many now at this point. More so for alpha-gal, I filled up right away when I started advertising that I was treating for alpha-gal because this is such a problem, and it's so prolific in this area. Um, and out of all of my patients, most people are now desensitized to their allergens. It's very non-invasive. However, I will say that if you are a person that has anaphylactic reactions to certain allergens, we will not ever you know, suggest for you to re-expose yourself to that, but this will help to desensitize your reaction in case of accidental exposures or cross-contaminations. A lot of people, Jessica, I'm sure you know this, they, they wonder if acupuncture hurts them, you know, because they know they see the pins and everything like that. That's what they think. Um, it, give us uh, your response when people come to you like that. Well, the needles that we use are in the ear, and they you, they will be retained, but they are tiny, tiny. Most of the time, I when I show people the needles, they're like, oh, my gosh, that's it. And, of course, you don't feel them entering in your ear at all. Um, we do retain them for three to four weeks, depending on the severity of the allergies. Um, and, you know, I give you a whole aftercare instructions. They Most people never even have acknowledge that they're there. They forget that they're there. They're not painful at all. They're not painful going in or coming out. So it's a very non-invasive, minimally invasive 
treatment for something that is a chronic problem. Gotcha. And and you mentioned, um, you, you know, you, acupuncture's for all kinds of ailments and allergies. I mean, is it is it something for, you know, someone who has a an allergy, uh, like a food allergy? I mean, is it, is it just everything? Yeah, I mean, alpha-gal being one of the food allergies that is for, for red meat or any hoof animals, really, it's an oligosaccharide allergy, up to gluten, dairy, peanuts, soy, um, or even chemical exposures like certain laundry detergents or perfume, chemicals, exposures that, you know, people that have eczema have a lot of sensitivities to chemicals, whether job-related or, or whatsoever. So we can help address a lot of things um, with this procedure. That's fantastic. Okay, good deal. Um, so we're learning about this right now. We have thousands of people that watch us on the digital desk, Jessica. If, uh, if someone wanted to learn more about the SAAT or anything else, um, where can they go? Well, we, my website is saatmemphis.com. Um, I have a lot of FAQs on the procedure. I actually have some videos that explaining the procedure. Um, you can chat with me. There's a chat function or send me an email if you have very specific questions. I'm more than happy to respond and answer any, any questions that you may have. If you want to get started right away, there's a book online function that you can go ahead and just book online um, with me and we can get going. All right, Jessica Puckett, we appreciate you and the knowledge uh, you just dropped on the digital desk. Thank you so much for uh, illuminating us to this uh, procedure to help people who are big-time allergy sufferers. We appreciate it. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. So you've made your New Year's resolutions, and now you're thinking, well, I may, and maybe I'm still keeping it, or uh, I've, I've gave up long ago. What do you do now? <laughs> How do you still keep those goals, even though you've had some setbacks? Well, let's bring in uh, Methodist Lebanon Healthcare Counselor, uh, Kim McCaskill. Um, she is here to kind of talk to us and, and talk through this issue. Uh, Kim, good morning. I, you know, I feel like there are a lot of people that in this boat, right? Where do we start? Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Yes, of course, there are many people in this boat. And I think I want to start off by saying that there's nothing magical about January 1st, right? We're sort of cultured to believe that there's something really special that's going to help us stick to our goals if we make a New Year's resolution. And the reality is that the new wears off of everything that we try, whether it's the new car that we bought or the new exercise program or the new relationship that we just got into, the new wears off of everything. And eventually we're going to run into challenges sticking to our goals. So it's very important not to be too hard on ourselves and to understand that we can always regroup and that it's normal to fall, sort of drift away from our goal and drift towards our goal. Okay, so now that we've established that this is completely normal, how do we get back on the way to either, you know, better finances, better weight loss, better health, um, that sort of thing? Well, one thing I would like to encourage people to think about is how much are you criticizing yourself when you don't stick to the exact goals that you've made for yourself? Goals are important to set so that we know where we want to go. But if we don't 
really just take appraisal of what it is that's causing us to get off track and we get bogged down in criticizing ourselves like, oh, I'm a loser or, oh, I can't stick to anything. We're really not going to make much progress and we're more likely to give up. So try to stay away from self-criticism and understand we're all human beings. We're all going to fall short of the goals that we set. Let's just focus on what got in the way. How can we do a little bit better tomorrow? And just try to be patient with ourselves and understand that uh, life is a challenge and goals are a challenge. So we're really either drifting away or drifting toward. So we just want to focus on, okay, I didn't really, I kind of drifted away today. So how do I drift back towards my goal? And if we look at it as a constant sort of in motion state of our lives, then we can do a lot better with, um, with progress. Right. I, I like that. You know, I mean, look, these things happen. And, and so we just have to consistently restart or refresh or um, work towards that goal that we set, you know, January 1st or what have you. Um, what else can we tell uh, people who uh, may have had a little bit of a setback? One thing to focus on is, did you set a goal to that was too high or unrealistic? You know, there are a lot of... Um, articles out there in in the media, magazines, uh, blogs, and so forth, that can be sort of confusing. And a lot of those uh, programs and goals will try to get people to do too much too fast. And we can then put pressure on ourselves to do too much too fast. So I'm a big, a big advocate of what the research really shows from a behavioral perspective that really inching towards our goals tends to be better than trying to start something really big, really fast. Um, it can set us up to feel like we're failing when really what we've done is just set something that's a little too much in the very, uh, you know, from the very beginning. So for example, if somebody is gonna work on a couch to 5K program, you may need to do the uh, first week of that program for two weeks or three weeks. There's nothing wrong with that. And gradually move yourself towards uh, the goal. Uh, you really have to look at your mind and your body and what works for you and try very hard not to get into comparing yourself to someone else and how they seem to be doing with their goals. Because really, you should just be competing with yourself. Am I doing a little bit better today than I was doing yesterday? And if not, what got in the way and how do I do a little bit better tomorrow? And again, don't get into self-criticism about falling short of something that you wanted to do for yourself. Just keep focusing on what you can do to move a little bit, a little bit further. I like it. I like it. Keep going. Absolutely. So where can we get some of these tips online? Uh, perhaps uh, a, a website where we can um, focus in on some of the things you discussed. Well, you know, with uh, Methodist Healthcare, there is the uh, Healthy 901 program uh, that focuses on um, how to live a healthier lifestyle. Um, look at uh, the Surgeon General has, you know, great information uh, available on the web. Uh, really, what I want to encourage people to look at is what is research based. There are a lot of um, programs that are set up that you can find all sorts of things online that may not be based in research. So what I want to encourage the public to do, use Google, you know, do, do your research, look online, but who wrote the information? Where does it come from? Is it coming from a source where it's, uh, you know, published in, you know, medical journals? Um, or are we really not sure where this information came from? So consider the source when you're looking up information about, you know, about your health and about goals. Um, lifestyle management and things of that nature. Okay, Kim McCaskill, counselor with Methodist Healthcare, Methodist Labonner Healthcare. We appreciate your time, Kim. Thanks so much for the enriching conversation. We appreciate it.
Good morning, everyone. Andrew Douglas in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. You know, we've been talking a lot about back to school season. It's certainly upon us. There are some school districts that are already back in class this week. And as the weeks go by, more and more school districts will be back in the class. And then uh, about a month from now, you're going to have the fall of college universities across uh, Memphis and the Mid-South. They're going to be going back to school right now. And there are some conversations that most likely you want to have, perhaps you need to have, or maybe you haven't thought about having before your child uh, steps foot on their college campus. Let's bring in uh, someone to talk more about those tough conversations you need to have with your child. I'm joined now by David McGee. He is the author and creator of the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing at the University of Mississippi. And uh, David, I appreciate you joining us this morning. What is the number one thing that parents uh, should talk to their children before they step on foot of a college campus. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, in this day and age, and this is such an important conversation you're having, all parents need to listen. And it goes all the way down to middle school, frankly, students. Pills can kill. And they, these students today have grown up in an era that you can swallow a pill for anything. They think maybe it was their friend's prescription. The truth is most of these pills, they'll call Adderall or Xanax that are traded, they're counterfeit. And often they have fentanyl and they're deadly. And we see that play out all over the Mid-South. Tell us about the, um, I, I have to say, um, and I full disclosure here, I have a son who is starting at the University of Mississippi uh, this weekend. He's actually doing a southern, uh, a, uh, a summer intercession there, taking three weeks and then starting the fall semester. So hotty toddy to you uh, and, yes. and I guess to him as well. <laughs> but um, tell me. Tell me about the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing. I know yeah. it's relatively new. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, so I lost a son. Uh, my son, William, was an honors college student at Ole Miss, and he ran track, made it all the way to the SEC Outdoor Track and Field Championships and the 400 hurdles. But he self-medicated, and he died of an accidental drug overdose. Uh, I myself uh, battled addiction and am in recovery. And, but we have another son who nearly died and is now 11 years sober, and a daughter who battled eating disorder and is in recovery. So we suffered loss. But what we've seen is that if we can reach students earlier, meet them where they are, help them understand help is available, they can thrive and find their joy they deserve. So we got the William McGee Center opened at Ole Miss and then the Institute followed. The center works with students on the Ole Miss campus around well-being, substance issues. The Institute's doing work in schools around the Mid-South, even the country, beginning the conversation of, okay, we teach students algebra earlier because we know they need it. What do we need to teach them about their brain, their feelings, how they process emotions rather than self-medicate? Self-medication ultimately always steals your joy. It does not work. You mentioned uh, pills that can kill and uh, and some of the issues associated with that. Um, and, and you list, in fact, five tough conversations to have with your child before they head off to college. Number one, pills can kill. Let's go through the list a little bit and, yeah. and uh, go in depth on the on the on the five. Great, things. great. Number two. Oh man, this is so important, particularly for young men. We find marijuana today isn't your grandmother's marijuana, and, and, and we can laugh about that. But it's a fact. Marijuana today is four and five hundred percent stronger than it was 20 years ago. It's highly addictive. Most parents don't realize this. I didn't. My sons were using it habitually. I thought it wasn't addictive. Um, that led them into drug dealer relationships who were then selling them pills. Marijuana was paralyzing them. Students today often vape marijuana, which then gets it at potency far in advance of the four to 500 percent stronger. Uh, the other thing is you really got to understand number three is today's addict doesn't look like the picture of the disheveled guy on the street corner. Today's addict, particularly at a college campus, very likely may be your roommate, uh, a social member organization uh, friend. Um, it could be you. Young people don't know how to recognize the signs because so many of their peers are doing the very same thing. So it's important for parents to look for the signs. 
Are they missing classes? Are they having trouble hanging on to money? Are they not looking you in the eye? Um, the other thing is we have to help students understand number four is self-medication isn't the answer to joy. The studies are clear, but you can cultivate your own joy. And the studies show if we're getting eight or more hours asleep a night as we need, rest, the outdoors, walking sends blood to your brain. And if you're feeling depressed, uh, a walk in some sunshine is almost like some inst instant lift. Um, and number five, you have to understand parents and students, if you need help, it works. Get it, anxiety, depression, aloneness, marijuana addiction, it works. It can take some time, but there is no shame in that. And you're not alone. Many of us have been there. And I don't wanna bury your children or your neighbor's children, and I've done too much of that, starting with my own. Wow, uh, that really hits on a, a number of different issues. Um, and, and when you tell people about um, these five things that you mentioned, the tough conversations you should have, um, what has been the reaction from parents and students? I'm curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's been so robust, first from students, honestly, because I'm having a, a frank conversation that they welcome because they're suffering. Then it's getting me in schools all across the country. Then parents started inviting me and we were seeing crowds of 200. I was at Christian Brothers School in Memphis. I've been there twice. We had 200 plus parents show up. So actually, I turned that talk into this book I've got coming out this week called Things Have Changed. I didn't really plan on writing a guidebook, but what I found is parents don't have this information. They don't know how to talk to their children. They don't know how things have changed. So I just rolled it up in a guidebook, and now I'll go do the tour in Memphis and beyond all over the country, uh, continuing to spread this gospel. You mentioned on a number of different levels, uh, things have changed from, say, 20, 30 years ago uh, when we were in college, for example. Uh, what would you say is the biggest change and the biggest surprise for parents when you talk about the changes? I think for parents, the biggest surprise for them is how much their teens and college students are struggling because they're making A's and they've been on the a starter on the travel team and their homecoming queen or this or that. But they're struggling with suicidal ideation and depression and aloneness. It has changed so much. We don't understand yet fully what's happening in this social media era. What we got to know is this generation of students, they're the first ones to come along, born into the iPhone, born into social media apps. And the studies are clear. It's tinkering with their emotions and their mind, how they see themselves, how they view others. Something is happening, and it's bigger than COVID. And parents are going to have to dig into what I say is you got to start having open-ended conversations with your teens. You got to quit telling them how they should feel and what they should do. And you have to ask them, how do you feel? This is a very interesting conversation and something that needs to be had, certainly. I mean, uh, mental health is, is something that we constantly talk about uh, for young adults and, and for teens out there. I mean, it is paramount. You're absolutely right. And um, certainly screen time and phones and computers are, are contributing uh, to some of the problems out there. Um, anything else you want to mention that you haven't touched on, David, that you feel is important with this conversation? I'd say to parents, um, well, you do what I did, which is take a look in the mirror yourself. And I don't say that in a judgmental way. When I looked at myself in the mirror, when I thought my children were struggling, I realized that I had picked up and adapted new habits. And when I addressed those habits, my children responded in accord. Unfortunately, we lost William, but my other two children now are years successful in recovery. And I needed to look in the mirror. I wanted my children to look up to me as a role model. Well, I achieved that. They did. And what I learned is they were watching my every behavior, cracking a drink open at five every night, self-medicating myself, you know. 
And what I would say to parents is, look, I mean, this is this life is short. You want the best out of it yourself. It never hurts to do that checkup, that self-assessment. Every moment is a new beginning. And that better is just waiting for that first step in that direction. And you know, it, not only um, the William McGee Institute for Student Wellbeing is on the Ole Miss campus, but I, I believe most colleges, if not all of them, have some sort of uh, wellness center where students can go if they yeah. need um, that help. It's so important that the parents yes. and the student know that, um, that there always is a place that, that can offer help and assistance in, uh, in, this, in this crazy time where things, as you say, things have changed a lot. Um, David McGee, I really appreciate this conversation. It's so valuable. It's so important to the thousands of people that join us on the digital desk here. Thanks very much. God bless you and your family. Um, I know it. I know it's tough to to talk about these things, but I know you're helping people at the same time. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys helping us spread the message, and thanks for the work you do. Good morning, everyone. Andrew Douglas in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Money and financial responsibilities. That tops the list of some of the biggest stressors out there for so many American families. The American Heart Association has revealed some new research this morning linking stress to cardiovascular disease. You know, the summertime is supposed to be uh, more relaxing, more chill, I guess you could say. It's supposed to be easier, but many of us feeling more stressed than ever before. Let's bring in uh, psychologists. Andrea Iglesias uh, to discuss more about these stresses and stress levels and how to bring it down. Um, good morning, Dr. Iglesias. Can you talk about today's biggest stressors for us according to this study? Of course. Hi, good morning. So happy to be here with you. So the biggest stressors that we're seeing according to our studies are family responsibility, work, health, money. So uh, stressors can be at individual, but these are the things that are coming up over and over again uh, for a lot of people. Yeah, and it, I mean, the, the sky high inflation, everything's costing more. I'm sure that has to deal with it as well. How does it impact our heart health? So when people think about stress, you know, they often think about just their mental well-being. But the truth is, is that stress has an impact on our overall well-being, our physical well-being, and certainly our heart health. So what ends up happening, especially with chronic stress, is that we can see an increase in heart rate and blood pressure and inflammation, as well as some behaviors that may not be very healthy. So not sleeping well, not eating well, not exercising, and all of those things come together to eventually lead to potentially chronic stress. So it's really important that we're paying attention um, to that connection so that we can prevent things from getting worse. Who's most at risk when it comes to these stressors, doctor? So we know that stress levels are going up in general for everybody. So this is something for everyone to pay attention to. But the studies are showing as well that the Hispanic community is particularly impacted. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about today is the American Heart Association's campaign called Protecting Your Wellbeing Together. This is a campaign that uh, provides education, resources around this connection between stress and heart health. And it's a campaign that's uh, offered in both English and Spanish. So this is really important because it becomes a, a resource uh, for everybody uh, no matter which language they speak. 
What are some healthy ways to deal with the stress that Americans are feeling right now? Well, the most important thing is to think about what are the manageable steps that you can take in your life. So it's going to look a little bit different for everybody, but a few things that you can try are, for example, taking breaks during the day. So depending on your work schedule thinking, how you can protect time to take a breather, to ground yourself, um, to make sure you're not going back to back, protecting time for exercise. For me, even just going outside for 30 minutes and taking a walk. Uh, can make a huge difference, you know, being out with fresh air, connecting with loved ones, uh, with family, with friends, making an effort, being really intentional, maybe even making sure that you're having dinner together every night. And of course, you know, grounding yourself in gratitude is is really important, has shown to have really positive effects in managing stress. Yeah, gratitude is big. Uh, I certainly see that. Where can, We've touched on a number of different uh, uh, issues and ways that, to help families out there. Where can we get some more information online? Well, the campaign has some really great resources. So if you go to heart.org backslash stress, you can find lots of great tips on managing stress and more information on these studies linking, you know, heart disease and, and heart health with stress. So you can learn more about that and not just educate yourself, but also those around you to make sure that, you know, we're taking care of ourselves and each other. Okay, psychologist Dr. Andrea Iglesias, we really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I want to bring in uh, someone from Methodist Le Bonheur Hospital. This is Dr. Webb Smith. Uh, he works at Le Bonheur. And, and uh, Dr. Smith, good morning to you. Let me um, ask you something about some of the challenges uh, that some of the children face here in Memphis and the Mid-South. If you were to name, you know, maybe two or three of the biggest challenges they have, what would they be? Good morning to you. Yeah, good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Memphis uh, is is certainly uh, a, a sort of a, a position where obesity, and diabetes, heart disease, those things are are a big, big concern for our, for our children. Um, and, that, you know, that's really across the entire Mid-South area. I got gotcha. you. And, um, and why is a family approach to health and wellness so beneficial? I mean, y you can start some great habits early in life, and that would carry on uh, throughout their life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the family-based approach is, has been shown to be clearly the the the, the best way to intervene, and, and some of that is because uh, your parents uh, modeling these behaviors, kids, you know, will 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 follow along, and um, and that becomes sort of their their baseline behaviors, and and also. You know, when you um, when you have a family based approach, the the child makes some decisions, but parents are often uh, sort of setting the stage for a lot of these things. So if you can kind of catch everybody, then everybody's on the same page and um, and and push in the same direction. It, it tends to be a much more impactful um, behavior change. So tell us about um, Healthier 901 Kids Fest. I understand this is um, this is an event that's happening April 13th, right? That's correct. Yeah, we're we're very excited about this. This is a kind of a come out of the larger Healthier 901 uh, campaign, which launched in the fall, and we wanted to have something that was a little bit more kid focused um, and and focused on um, you know introducing kids to some of these health behaviors in a way that's fun and interactive. And so they're going to have a lot of opportunity uh, to try maybe some new activities uh, in in a way that um, that they haven't uh, as a family and, and come through at an event which I think will be a lot of fun. Um, and really, it's it's slanted so that 
kids of any ability can come in and participate and have a good time and uh, learn maybe some new things at, at the event. So, um, so give us some details. It's, um, it's this Saturday, it's April 13th from two until four in the afternoon. Um, tell us where it is, what's supposed to happen, how parents can sign up, all that stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's this, this uh, coming Saturday at the Le Bonner, uh Lawn, so right by the main entrance of the hospital. We have a beautiful new uh, remodeled space out here that we're going to have sort of a lot of these exercise stations and, and information set up. Uh, so parents can just come on by and, and bring their kids. There's really no, uh, no registration for it. Um, and uh, we'll be here for a couple hours and have a, have a lot of events that they can uh, experience and, and, and try out. Okay, so um, is, how do parents need to prepare for this? Uh, is there something they need to do or do they just show up? Um, is there a way to prepare their kids for this? Uh, you know, they're, uh, they, they can really just show up for the show up for the event. Um, they're, you know, I think talking to your kids about, uh, you know, that that they're going to have the opportunity to try some new activities and and encourage them to, um, you know, be sort of adventurous and, and take advantage of these things would be uh, maybe the only thing they need to do. I, I think it can come out as they are kids of really any age um, and uh, uh, come out and you know, try out some bocce ball and soccer and uh, maybe some pickleball or uh, we're going to have cooking demonstrations. So it'd be a wide variety of activities that they can uh, come out and interact with. How else can parents set positive examples for their children? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, they're, uh, the Healthier 901 app, uh, they, there's a lot of uh, really good health information on the app that they can go download and sign up for uh, for free. You can get that um, at, I think, really all the major, like the uh, Apple and Google Play stores and all. Um, that, that will give some good ideas for, for how they can be, act, you know, they can be involved in this space. But I, I really think, you know, just being active and um, and engaging in these conversations with your with your whole family is a really important way to start the first step and realize that there's no wrong way to be active and there's no wrong way to uh, to try to take uh, steps towards a healthier lifestyle. So I think they uh, you know really just the attempt is the most important thing and and having the conversation and see where it goes. I would think also limiting screen time. I mean that is so huge. Uh, you just see it everywhere. It's just you know, they got to put away the phones, the screens, and, uh, and get out and just enjoy a good old-fashioned exercise, right? That's right. I mean, I think, I think physical activity, exercise, those are key and uh, really fundamental parts of growth and development. Uh, and, you, you know, by being active, you're, you're, you know, having your body learn all these new movement patterns. And, you know, screen time is, is a, you know, a part of our, our society now. And I think keeping that in check so that there still is time for being active is a, is a really important thing. I mean, there's, you know, obviously through school and those things that some of these uh, technologies are, are really helpful, um, but with, you know, sort of all things within moderation. Um, and I think, you know, getting enough sleep and get, trying to get uh, good sleep behaviors in, that's, uh, that's when you do grow uh, and develop. So those are really important uh, behaviors as well, limiting screen time, um, you know, trying to uh, eliminate sugar, sweetened beverages in your diet. Those kind of things are, are really big uh, and, and first steps towards a healthier lifestyle. Okay, so Kids Fest, is there a place um, maybe online where people can get some more information about it? Yes, they can go to the Healthier901 uh, website, which is healthier901.com. Uh, and uh, slash Kids Fest, you can get information there. Uh, there's also information on the Labonner website as well. Um, and uh, we, you know, we we hope that people will will access that and come on out on Saturday and have a have a great time with us. All right, Dr. Webb Smith, uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, good luck on uh, on Saturday. I'm sure it's going to be a great time. Great weather for it too. Uh, it should be a great event. Thanks. I know. Tell tell Ron. Thanks for the great weather. <laughs> you got it. All right, Dr. Smith. Thank you. All right, another live look from our High Five camera here in Midtown Memphis. Lots of clouds out there. We'll be talking about the forecast in 60 seconds.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. My friends, a first alert to heavy rainfall potential here over the course of the next couple of days. It starts today. As you're heading out the door, you'll need the umbrellas, the rain jackets all day long. Temperatures hovering in the 60s and of course, rain will come in waves, so it may not rain constantly, but it may be raining persistently over the next couple of days. Of course, the midweek impact heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. And this is something that we got to keep in the back of our mind. Water rises from our creeks, tributaries, main stem rivers as well as uh, some of the storage uh, areas, uh, say Sardis Lake, uh, Grenada Lake and Enid Lake. Uh, that's something that we'll be watching here the next couple of days because of course the water is going to start to come up. That's going to start to flow down a stream and eventually make its way down towards the Mississippi. Uh, the uh, Yazoo River backwater as they have to discharge some of that water, not to mention uh, we've got water coming down the Mississippi that's going to have some big rises probably here, not to the point to where we're talking big flooding, but definitely noticeable considering that it has been so dry as of late. Remember, we were dealing with a huge deficit along the Mississippi River back a couple of months ago, and now we're back to almost full capacity along the river as we approach a minor flood stage here soon enough. Here's a look at what we got going on as far as the rainfall is concerned. Again, it's not just here. You got to think about what's going on upstream as well. Some upstream water rises are expected along the Ohio and uh, Missis Mississippi River Valleys and also for our Tennessee River Valley folks as well. That's going to start heading down towards uh, across this area and it's going to be a very messy go of things here in the next few days. Heavy rainfall. You see the red areas. Those are three plus inches of rainfall and some spots could be even higher than that. I will say it's looking more likely that we'll have some pockets here in North Mississippi where we will probably be approaching by the time we get towards Thursday three to five inches. I think most spots though, uh, especially north of I-41 to three and then two to four is a general rule south, but there will be some pockets of five inches of rain not out of the realm of possibility. Now when you look at this again, this is where the flooding potential would like to be again across the Mississippi uh, Delta into south southern portions of Arkansas, and northern Louisiana down towards about Jackson, Mississippi tomorrow. The moderate risk for flooding goes a little farther to the east here in Memphis and across the mid south. We're underneath a slight risk for flooding the entire next two days. That's more so low lying, poor drainage, flooding, flooding. Uh, so that's something that we'll be watching as well. That may slow you down. In addition to the rainfall, the potential for an isolated strong storm or two Nile, the realm of possibility later on today here in uh, portions of East Central Arkansas, and Northwest Mississippi. And also tomorrow, a little better chance, but even that not the worst looking scenario playing out. I think wind and hail the primary issue for us, uh, but the farther south that you go, you see this red area that's a moderate risk for severe weather and it does look like uh, damaging winds tornado risk also in play here. Jackson, Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, down towards Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian and the farther north that you go, you start losing the instability, but it's still plenty of moisture to work with and enough that we could feature a risk for a few stronger storms. Thursday, a quieter day from the standpoint of severe weather and flooding, but still some rain in play. Let's go with our first alert future cast again, some showers and storms. There might be one or two gusty ones making their way across portions of North Mississippi late this afternoon and that will shift out of here. The thing is that we'll go into a relative lull in the activity. Rain showers pretty light as we get closer to uh, five, six o'clock. There's another wave that moves across portions of Mississippi that will shoot northward some rain opportunities. A little bit of a lull tomorrow morning. Another wave of rain and storms, maybe a gusty storm or two as we get towards your Wednesday late morning, early afternoon. Re a relative lull in the activity late afternoon into the early evening. More rain moving through here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday, and that will be about the last part of the heavy rain aspect. We may need to up the rain chance on Thursday uh, to cover the lingering effects of the rain that will be pushing across the mid south. Temperatures in the 60s to near 70 overnights in the 60s and 50s. The rain will start to taper off, but as we go through Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to start to kick up 30 35 mile per hour wind gusts on Wednesday, 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts come Thursday. We'll still still say breezy on Friday. The high near 70 will go upper 70s as we get closer to the upcoming weekend with a chance for a few showers to return by Monday of next week.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5. I'm Andrew Douglas. Fidelity Investment State of Retirement Planning Study finds that two in three Americans say the pandemic made them more intentional about focusing on their personal passions and dreams in retirement. But what does that mean, really? Uh, joining us now to discuss this issue is uh, someone from Fidelity Investments, Leanna Divini, Vice President uh, uh, of a branch at Fidelity Investments. Uh, Leanna, uh, good morning to you. Tell me more about this study and what does it mean uh, to all of us? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Andrew. Well, there's no doubt the pandemic has had a major impact on all parts of life, including retirement. Our, fuddy, our study finds it's made 66% of Americans become more intentional about their retirement goals. And people are redefining what they want retirement to look like. Two thirds of Americans now look forward to working for pleasure and would prefer an idea of a phased retirement. That said, many concerns remain. Inflation, consumer debt, and building emergency savings are the main roadblocks to reaching savings goals. The good news is 75% of people investing feel confident about retiring when and how they want. We know that having a retirement plan helps people feel better prepared and more confident to weather any storm. Okay, so what is the difference between this retirement reimagined and traditional retirement, Leanna? So over the last several years, American witnessed, Americans witnessed a global pandemic and record high inflation. This has forced them to reevaluate everything from what's most important to where to live, where to work. And through these hardships, people are now approaching their golden years with more intention and opportunity. And with the rise of flexible working options, people can now work from anywhere. So traditional retirement, it no longer means the ends of one's working life. There's this opportunity for a second act. Leanna, there have been so many people that have retired and then they've unretired. Uh, you know, a lot of times people are concerned uh, about this sky high inflation that we're dealing with and that their dollar doesn't go as far anymore. Is that one of the main reasons why people are going back to work? If so, what are some other reasons? The reason unretiring is gaining traction is it's evenly divided. So both financial reasons, to your point, and personal factors. Among nearly 20% of the respondents who have unretired, 37% say it was to increase income for essential expenses like mortgage or health care. Another 37% say they unretired because they needed activity. This has also prompted young people to consider retiring sooner, given the option that unretiring is on the table if they wish or they need. Also, the study finds that Americans across all generations wish they began planning earlier. What kind of impact um, can a solid retirement plan have? And when should you start? I know that everyone talks about starting in your 20s. Um, sometimes you don't make as much money in your 20s and you can't start as much as you would like. Um, let's talk about that issue. We hear this so often, and our study finds that Americans across all generations regret not kicking off their retirement planning journey sooner, especially boomers and Gen Xers. They wish they'd started roughly 10 years earlier. It's important to remember that no matter where you are in your retirement savings journey, it's never too late to get on the right track. Fidelity has three tips to help you prepare for retirement. So first, save as much as you can. Fidelity recommends saving at least 15% of your income each year, and that includes an employer match. Next, figure out your asset allocation strategy based on how far you are from retirement and how comfortable you are with risk. Lastly, make sure you reevaluate your plan regularly. There are advantages to waiting longer to retire or considering that phased approach Yet that gives more time to build savings. All right, Leanna Davini, we appreciate you, Fidelity Investments. Thanks so very much.
Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Did you know that more than 16 million Americans are diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder known as ADHD? It ranges from children, teens to adults. And right now there is a nationwide shortage of the medications used to treat ADHD. In fact, the FDA announced the shortage back in October, blaming manufacturing delays. But there are researchers and experts that say the shortage is more about an increase in demand. ADHD diagnoses have spiked significantly during the pandemic. Let's bring in someone to talk more about this issue. I'm joined now by Dr. Greg Mattingly, the associate clinical professor of Washington University, a physician as well. Um, good morning, doctor. Let's talk about, first off, I know what ADHD is, but for our audience and viewers, can you talk a little bit in layman's terms about what ADHD is and how common it has become? Good morning. Good morning. So ADHD is probably many of your listeners know, it's a common condition. Matter of fact, it's the most common neurologic condition in all of childhood, not just here in the United States, but all around the world. So here in the United States, but if I went to Canada, if I went to Europe, if I went over to Asia, it's eight to 10% of kids meet criteria for ADHD. So it's a common condition. And one of the things that we have learned over the last 20 years is for most kids, it's not gonna go away. If this is the way you're wired, 80 to 90% of kids are gonna have that as they become teenagers, as they go off to university, as they start, start that first job and as they become adults. Common symptoms are I get distracted, it's hard to focus, I get bored and when I get bored then everything kind of accelerates and I find myself getting frustrated. Maybe I get fidgety and restless. Maybe I blurt things out and I interrupt other people around me. So problems with disorganization, time management, frustration tolerance because of those things for our patients with ADHD. You know, uh, doctor, I have some uh, I have some family members uh, that have ADHD and um, it, it seems to affect them in different ways. And, and there is a difference, right? I mean, the symptoms are different for men and women, boys and girls, uh, all across the spectrum. A hundred percent. And that's why the answers are not going to be one size fit all answers either. Um, so some people have ADHD and they have a lot of the hyperactivity when they're kids. Other people, it's a lot of disorganization. It's hard to concentrate. I get overwhelmed by things. I have a lot of anxiety because of that. And I get frustrated. Um, some of them have a hard time shutting their brain off at night, falling asleep at night because my brain is still going can be a frustration for some of our, our patients with ADHD. And then some of our adults with ADHD can be problems around my temper. I get frustrated, I tend to blow. So how do you learn to modulate that as one of your symptoms that's a result of having ADHD? So you are the president-elect of the American uh, Professional Society of ADHD-Related Disorders. Um, can you talk about how ADHD is typically treated these days? I know it, everyone um, has the idea of, of medication, and there's different medications, right? A hundred percent. So if there's good news for your listeners out there is we have a lot of different options. When I was first in practice 30 years ago, our options were just short acting stimulants and you had to take them multiple times a day. And a lot of people didn't like the side effects. They didn't like the way they felt when those things kind of kicked in and wore off. And we know those medicines being short acting Ritalin or Adderall, they can be misused or abused sometimes by people that are doing the wrong things. A lot of our newer treatment options are once daily medicines. You take them once a day and they give you very low levels of medicine, just enough to help to improve your symptoms, but not so much that you're having as many of the unwanted side effects. So we have over 30 different treatment options right now that are approved for children with ADHD. A lot of those are also approved for adults. And we have four non-stimulants that are approved for ADHD, two of those that are approved for adults, atomoxetine and Kelbri. So it's not even always a stimulant option, and it's certainly not always a short-acting stimulant where you, that you have to take multiple times a day. Do patients grow out of this? I, I've always heard that, you know, by the time if someone in their teenage years, for example, is diagnosed with ADHD, can they grow out of that ADHD by the time they're in their mid to late 20s? How does that work? Yeah, so one of the myths of ADHD is there's a couple of myths. Boys, not girls. You tend to grow out of it. Only take your medicine when you think you need it. We know those are all not the best outcomes. We know that boys are more common when they're young, but as you become an adult, women are equally com common with ADHD. 
we know that for most people, you're not going to grow out of it. 80 to 90 percent are going to continue to have some set of symptoms as they go into adulthood. So learning how ADHD affects your life so you can have the most successful life possible, learning where there's a good fit for your symptoms. If I stick you behind a boring desk and make you do that job all day with ADHD, it's going to be hard. But if I give you a job that's a little more interesting, maybe you're interacting with people, maybe you're doing what you're doing, where you're giving interviews to people and staying active, that may be a better fit for someone with ADHD. Um, so learning about your condition, telling your clinician, hey, here's where I see difficulties in my life. Maybe it's at home with my wife in the evenings where I get frustrated because I'm disorganized. I'm just overwhelmed. When we introduce you uh, to the digital desk, we talked about this nationwide shortage that was um, very uh, it was announced back in the fall of last year. Uh, do we still have this shortage? And and my understanding is that there are so many people being diagnosed. How did the pandemic have an impact on the diagnosis of ADHD? 100%. So during the pandemic, as we were all sitting at home doing our jobs virtually, you know, our kids were having to learn at home virtually. If you had problems with concentration being distracted, it came up to the forefront. Everybody could see it. So parents were looking at their kids saying, God, I know the teachers brought this up, but now I see it with my kids. I need to get them some help. Parents themselves looked at themselves and they said, God, I'm overwhelmed with this. I've always been wired this way, but in this current digital world, this is just overwhelming. So the rates of ADHD and people coming in for help did go up during the pandemic. Then we had a fixed supply of medications out there. And that supply is probably not going to go up, especially the supply of short acting stimulants. So if you have increased demand with a fixed supply, that led to a nationwide shortage. Has it has that shortage gotten any better? Where are we on that? Yeah, unfortunately, it has not, especially with certain of short acting stimulants are in short supply all across the country here in Missouri. But if I went out to Washington, D.C., if I went to Baltimore, if I went to California, short acting stimulants are in short supply and they're probably going to stay that way. So that's made us all examine with our patients. Are there other long acting once daily treatments that may help to manage your symptoms, may even be a better fit for your symptoms, because those medicines do tend to have a better supply these days. Let's talk about those different options, because, yeah, the, if the shortage is going to stick around a while, let's let's talk, talk about different treatments. Of course. So I'll, I'll just give you a bunch of names you may want to think about with your clinician. And once again, this is a personal choice with you and you and your clinician. We have a long acting amphetamine called Vyvanse that still tends to have pretty good supply. And there's an even longer lasting one called Mydeus that has long supply. We have various versions of Concerta. Some of those are generic. Some of them are not. Some of those are available. Some are a little harder to get a hold of. And then we have some methylphenidates that come in a beaded formulation called Focalin or Metadate that tend to be available right now. We have two non-stimulants for adults that tend to be available, both atomoxetine and Kelbury. Both have pretty good supply all across the country. So I, I think those are some of the names you may think about. So we have shortages of some of the, the types of ADHD medicines, but we have other versions that are in pretty good supply. You know, this has been a, an interesting uh, interview, uh, doctor, and uh, something that's revealing to so many out there. I, I, we have thousands of viewers each and every morning joining us here, and I know that either someone knows or has a friend or perhaps a family member with ADHD. Where can they go to get some more information on what we talked about and any other questions they may have? I'll give you two resources. One is a group called CHAD, and CHAD makes a magazine once a month called Attitude. And CHAD is a group of patients that have ADHD that are advocates that put together these resources. So Attitude's a once a month magazine. In addition, APSARD, the organization that's a group of researchers, teachers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, APSARD.org, has a lot of resources and can steer you in places to learn more about ADHD. You know, this has been a great interview, Dr. Greg Mattingly, uh, Associate Clinical Professor, Washington University, and uh, we really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Action News 5 Digital Desk. I'm Andrew Douglas. Have you heard about pickleball? Pickleball is the hottest growing sport in the U.S. In the last three years, let me give you an example, it has gone up some 223%. This is according to Sports and Fitness Industry Association. So there's like nearly 50 million adults playing pickleball all year long. Let's bring in a pickleball pro from the Mid-South. I'm joined right now by Jonathan Goodwin. He's pickleball pro at Lifetime Fitness in Collierville. And full disclosure, I know Jonathan. I'm a member there. Uh, Jonathan, it's good to see you this morning. How's it going out there? Are you, How are the pickleball courts? Uh, oh, it's going real good, Andrew. We're actually here right now, keeping that, that, that statistics up right now. We got a lot of players. There's a full court. We got stacked paddles, and pickleball is booming right now. So tell We're having me a great a time about, this morning. <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. Tell me a little bit about pickleball for someone that's watching. You know, we have thousands of people that watch us each and every morning, Jonathan. Maybe someone's watching for the very first time. They know it's a little bit like tennis. Um, how would you describe it, and why is it so popular right now? Well, honestly, pickleball to me is different than any other sport. I love that, you know, you can have grandparents playing with their grandkids, uh, kids playing with their, their parents. And it's just one good, fun sport where everybody's involved. It's a good social sport. I actually picked this sport up during COVID time, and I haven't looked back yet. So everybody, you can see in the background, everybody's loving this sport. We all having a great time. It's a good, real good social sport. You know, a, a lot of times people thought that pickleball was, was just for maybe the seniors out there, the older Americans. But every time I pass by that area, Jonathan, there's all kinds of people, young, old, male, female, all kind of demographics. What, what makes it so popular? Well, that's one of the things that I also love about pickleball is it's such a big diversity. Like you just mentioned, we have different races. We have different ages. We have different everything. Um, the thing is about now, kids are picking up in the sport. And once a kid has played pickleball his whole life, we're seeing new levels of the sport. But even 78-year-olds, I just lost to some last weekend. That's what I love about the sport is that it's a great diversity sport and you can have a good time playing with whoever and however. You can meet a lot of good people. So um, give me the rules of it. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I mean, I, I've never played it, okay, but I've asked you about it plenty of times. Um, <laughs> so so, so give, me, uh, give me some basic rules. Well, the basic rules is that you always want to remember is stay out of that kitchen. But it's a whole lot of rules to the sport of uh, pickleball. Um, the number one rule that we really abide by, especially in my clinics here at Lifetime, is to have fun. Pickleball is a great sport. It's a fun sport. There's a lot of rules and all that. When you first learn, it can make your head stop pumping. But the number one rule that we go by is to have fun regardless of what happens. Like, that's the main thing that we get out of this, um, just to have fun. And after that, all the other rules will go behind it. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that, like, pickleball is taking over, you know, the golf course when it comes to business networking and that sort of thing. Um, can, you, can you shed some light into that? Oh, yeah. Pickleball is definitely taking over. If you ask any pickleball place, we're looking at every square inch of Memphis, and we're trying to see the best place that a pickleball court can go in. I played this sport for three months, and I got to looking in my backyard, Andrew, and I was like, I think I can put a pickleball court in my backyard. So now I have a court in my backyard. So pickleball is definitely taking over because the sport is so fun. And like you mentioned, all ages can play. So it's always a great investment to put pickleball there because it brings a lot of fun, lots of social moments, and just a great time overall. So it's definitely taking over the whole United States right now. <laughs> So, uh, so Jonathan, explain to me the the racket because you know that that I would think would be the number one piece of equipment you need. How is it different from from a, a tennis racket, racquetball, squash, that sort of thing? Yeah, so this is actually one of the more traditional rackets right here. Um, and the difference is, you know, tennis rackets have the big springs and have the big what's the name? These right here is real comfortable, like you said, for singers and all that, where singers. Not just holding this big heavy racket where it hurts their hand or have wrist issues and stuff like that. And it's just a good comfortable paddle. Uh, table tennis, more of a smaller paddle. So this right here is kind of like a fusion 
of different sports of you know just a different sports of of um, playing like paddle ball. So this is the one that we use for pickleball right here. Is that the only piece of equipment that you need? Uh, what would you recommend for somebody who's you know wants to start out who, their first lesson or second lesson? What what would you tell them to bring? Well, so at Lifetime we teach a whole lot of clinics and. Um, when we do our beginner clinics, what we tell them to bring is a paddle. If they don't have a paddle, we let them loan a paddle here at Lifetime Fitness uh, to bring tennis shoes. Your, your most important thing is to have good pickleball shoes because you don't want to come in something that doesn't support your ankle or anything like that. But other than that, pickleball is really not the most expensive sport to get into. It's just really to come with a real positive attitude and have a good time and Mostly, that's all you need, Andrews, just to jump into the sport, unless you want to do like what I did and buy a whole pickleball sport. <laughs> <laughs> I know you really like it. Um, so so let me ask you this. Um, we've done some stories of gauging the popularity of pickleball. We've done stories about all these people getting pickleball injuries, uh, mainly older Americans. What kind of injuries uh, come from pickleball? Well, sometimes with pickleball, I would say – um, it's not honestly a real big injury sport, but I would say the, the sport that the injuries that come from the sport is mainly could be avoided. A lot of times you're so excited about playing pickleball that you don't take those few minutes to stretch before pickleball and stuff like that. So for me personally, 75 degrees outside, I was playing pickleball and I just jumped right in and I hurt my lower back from just jumping in the sport. But that could have been avoided if I just would have took five to 10 minutes to stretch. So the number one thing I would say is to control the excitement and to take that time to stretch before you play because other than that, it's not really a big injury sport because of the low impact of the sport. So it's a real good sport to jump in. That's why a lot of seniors are in it because the low impact of the sport. But it can get physical too as the better you get. I got you. I got you. So, um, mm -hmm. how does that? How does the scoring work? Is it? Is it like tennis? Is it like uh, some other sport? What is it? So the biggest thing with scoring this is what I teach every class here at Lifetime. Also, the best thing to remember when you're playing doubles in pickleball is every game starts out zero zero two. So when I say zero zero two, just like basketball, soccer, anything like that, it starts out zero zero. But in pickleball, it starts with the second server. So that's the biggest thing. So once that second server or that team has messed up, then it goes to the next team, and they would say zero, zero, one. So each server gives an opportunity to serve the ball. Only on the beginning of the game does you know do you start off with server number two. So that's the most confusing thing of pickleball. But once you get that concept, then it kind of goes downhill from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Anything else you want to mention, Jonathan, uh, with regards to pickleball? If someone's watching this for the first time, they might want to check it out. Anything else you want to mention about it? Well, just like you know, Andrew, I'm always trying to talk you into pickleball. I'm always telling people to get into pickleball, especially here at Lifetime Gym, because Lifetime Gym, just as you see in the background, if it's a rainy day, it's a cloudy day, we're still here playing pickleball. Um, also have workouts. We have a cafeteria to eat in. We have pool area we have outdoor pool so the same thing with pickleball is you'll have a great opportunity me my family tried to talk me into pickleball for the longest i did not want to take up the sport but then i finally they finally caught me up on vacation and now here i am teaching pickleball so this is one sport that you would not regret it's a good time it's a great way to have a good time with your friends and everybody has somebody who's playing this sport right now whether it's your co-worker whether it's your aunt grandparents so it's a good sport to jump in so you can stay in touch with your friends and family also. So come nice. on. Andrew, we're looking for you too, Andrew. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I got to do it. I got to try it, Jonathan. Well, listen, I, I appreciate mm -hmm. your time this morning. Thanks so very much. I know pickleball is the hottest growing sport in the U.S., and uh, it, you sold it this morning. So uh, we appreciate your time, Jonathan. Thanks so very much. All right, thank you. I have to get back on the course, okay? <laughs> All right. We'll see you. All right, have a good one. All right. Okay, you do the same. All right, another live look from our High Five camera there in downtown Memphis. Lots of clouds out there. We're talking about the forecast in 60 seconds.
Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. My friends, a first alert to heavy rainfall potential here over the course of the next couple of days. It starts today. As you're heading out the door, you'll need the umbrellas, the rain jackets all day long. Temperatures hovering in the 60s and of course, rain will come in waves, so it may not rain constantly, but it may be raining persistently over the next couple of days. Of course, the midweek impact heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. And this is something that we got to keep in the back of our mind. Water rises from our creeks, tributaries, main stem rivers, as well as uh, some of the storage uh, areas, uh, say Sardis Lake, uh, Grenada Lake and Enid Lake. Uh, that's something that we'll be watching here the next couple of days because, of course, the water is going to start to come up. That's going to start to flow down a stream and eventually make its way down towards the Mississippi, uh, the uh, Yazoo River backwater as they have to discharge some of that water. Not to mention, uh, we've got water coming down the Mississippi that's going to have some big rises probably here. Not to the point to where we're talking big flooding, but definitely noticeable considering that it has been so dry as of late. Remember, we were dealing with a huge deficit along the Mississippi River back a couple of months ago, and now we're back to almost full capacity along the river as we approach a minor flood stage here soon enough. Here's a look at what we got going on as far as the rainfall is concerned. Again, it's not just here. You got to think about what's going on upstream as well. Some upstream water rises are expected along the Ohio and uh, Missis Mississippi River Valleys and also for our Tennessee River Valley folks as well. That's going to start heading down towards uh, across this area and it's going to be a very messy go of things here in the next few days. Heavy rainfall. You see the red areas. Those are three plus inches of rainfall and some spots could be even higher than that. I will say it's looking more likely that we'll have some pockets here in North Mississippi where we will probably be approaching by the time we get towards Thursday three to five inches. I think most spots though, uh, especially north of I-41 to three and then two to four is a general rule south, but there will be some pockets of five inches of rain, not out of the realm of possibility. Now, when you look at this again, this is where the flooding potential would like to be again across the Mississippi uh, Delta into south southern portions of Arkansas, and northern Louisiana, down towards about Jackson, Mississippi. Tomorrow, the moderate risk for flooding goes a little farther to the east here in Memphis and across the mid south. We're underneath a slight risk for flooding the entire next two days. That's more so low lying poor drainage flooding flooding. Uh, so that's something that we'll be watching as well. That may slow you down. In addition to the rainfall, the potential for an isolated strong storm or two now, the realm of possibility later on today here in uh, portions of East Central Arkansas, Northwest Mississippi. And also tomorrow, a little better chance, but even that not the worst looking scenario playing out. I think wind and hail the primary issue for us, uh, but the farther south that you go, you see this red area. That's a moderate risk for severe weather, and it does look like uh, damaging winds, tornado risk also in play here. Jackson, Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, Allen towards Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian, and the farther north that you go, you start losing the instability, but it's still plenty of moisture to work with and enough that we could feature a risk for a few stronger storms. Thursday, a quieter day from the standpoint of severe weather and flooding, but still some rain in play. Let's go with our first alert future cast again, some showers and storms. There might be one or two gusty ones making their way across portions of North Mississippi late this afternoon, and that will shift out of here. The thing is that we'll go into a relative lull in the activity. Rain showers pretty light as we get closer to uh, five, six o'clock. There's another wave that moves across portions of Mississippi that will shoot northward some rain opportunities. A little bit of a lull tomorrow morning. Another wave of rain and storms, maybe a gusty storm or two as we get towards your Wednesday late morning, early afternoon. Re relative lull in the activity late afternoon into the early evening. More rain moving through here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday, and that will be about the last part of the heavy rain aspect. We may need to up the rain chance on Thursday uh, to cover the lingering effects of the rain that will be pushing across the mid south. Temperatures in the 60s to near 70 overnights in the 60s and 50s. The rain will start to taper off, but as we go through Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to start to kick up 30 35 mile per hour wind gusts on Wednesday, 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts come Thursday. We'll still still say breezy on Friday. The high near 70 will go upper 70s as we get closer to the upcoming weekend with a chance for a few showers to return by Monday of next week.
Okay, Andrew Douglas here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Police departments nationwide are coping with critical staff shortages and are struggling to hire patrol officers, 911 operators, and plenty more. And this comes at a time where crime rates continue to skyrocket and relationships between the police departments and the communities they serve continues to become more tense. Let's bring in Markel Hutchins, CEO of Movement Forward and a po police community relations activist to talk more about this issue. Markel, good morning. How are you? Good morning. It's good to be with you. Good to have you here with us. How bad is this problem, Markel? Well, it is really the most challenging issue that I think our nation faces today at a time when crime and violence is escalating in some of our most vulnerable communities, law enforcement agencies continue to face a difficult time with retaining the talent that they have and attracting new talent. More law enforcement professionals have left the profession in the last 12 months than any other time in a consecutive 12 month period. So we really have to put a focus and shift the narrative away from the things that divide us to the things that unite us. And that's what I think our nation needs most at this moment. You notice, uh, Mark Hell, I, yeah, I'm thinking back, uh, you know, the, the 2020, um, you had the death of George Floyd, and then you had this huge undercurrent uh, of um, this negativity towards police departments nationwide. Is that part of this problem? I think that is a driving uh, factor in what is, is, is now a historic shortage in law enforcement. After the death of George Floyd and even the police-involved controversies that led up uh, to, to the protest of the summer of 2020. All of those things combined were a powder keg that have exploded on America's streets. The, the challenge that law enforcement faces is no one wants to be a police officer now because of all of the animosity, all of the anger, all of the resentment that has been directed and in some instances misdirected at our nation's law enforcement professionals. But the, the good news is our darkest hours as a nation have always been before the break of a new dawning. We created National Faith in Blue Weekend, the Memphis Police Department and the other law enforcement agencies in Memphis are very much engaged. They want to reach out to the community. So the second weekend in October across Memphis and across the country, law enforcement agencies and communities have an opportunity to come together, to sit together and reason together to figure out a pathway forward to deal with officer shortages, as well as the escalating crime and continuing tensions that face our country. Mark Hale, two years ago, uh, the defund the police movement was so, uh, it, it gained a lot of stature and status. And um, I'm just wondering how much of those residual effects of this defund the police movement is still uh, persistent among, uh, uh, among cities across the country and, you know, just contributing to this problem. You know, I have been at the forefront of human and civil rights for the last 25 years. I had the good fortune to be mentored by many of the icons that work very closely with Martin Luther King Jr., including his wife, Mrs. Coretta Scott King. I'm a civil rights, human rights, social justice guy. The notion of defunding the police is the arch enemy of communities of color and of any community. We cannot defund our way to safer streets nor to reduction in officer-involved tragedies. But what we've seen over the last several years has been the amplification of the vocal minority, those who seek to demonize law enforcement, drive wedges between police and communities. But that's a real small number of people. What we have seen is an epic failure in the defund the police movement. That was not a movement at all. I think most people in communities from Memphis to, to everywhere across this country understand that we have to stand in solidarity with our law enforcement professionals. We want to be policed with, with fairness and justice and equity, but we cannot allow these small few voices uh, to really put forward a message around defunding the police because that just hurts our communities. And that call for defunding of the police has really detracted and distracted people who might have otherwise chosen careers in law enforcement. So, Markel, here in Memphis, um, the Memphis Police Department has been trying all kinds of incentives to uh, boost up the 
um, the amount of officers within the department because there is a shortage and, and all the city leaders and the police leaders have said, hey, we need to hire hundreds more to get up to the staff where we are comfortable. They've tried all kinds of different hiring bonuses, um, free relocation options and services, all kinds of different incentives to get people to join the Memphis Police Department. And unfortunately, they're still at a significant deficit. Um, what's it going to take to overcome those deficits? It's going to take a shift in the narrative that we've heard nationally. We have to be the change that we want to see. There ought to be more young people, more people of color that consider and choose careers in law enforcement. Most people that get into that profession do so for the sake of serving their communities. We need to talk more about that. The police departments will not be able to attract and retain the talent that they want if they have to do the recruiting by themselves. Every faith-based organization in Memphis, you've got some wonderful faith-based organizations there. Every one of them, every community group, every neighborhood, every school, particularly the colleges and universities, should begin collaborating with this Memphis Police Department to figure out a way to get some of the people in those communities to actually join the police force. You have one, you have a world-class law enforcement executive in the person of uh, the director or chief, uh, C.J. Davis. She's a wonderful leader, but she cannot do it by herself. Every community organization, every faith-based group, every political leader has to come together with Memphis PD and really figure out a pathway forward to get people interested and involved in careers in law enforcement with the police department. You know, we've heard about that, and, 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 and that has been, that's kind of the rub, uh, Markel, is like getting the faith-based organizations and those communities together in order to help some of the uh, some of the biggest problems in Memphis. I've been a part of this community now for 16 years, and I've, I've seen how in, in important the faith-based community is here and, and how important it is to solve those big-time problems and, and come up with solutions to combat those problems. What's it going to take to really kind of change the idea, change the messaging, change the tone um, so that police forces across the country are not only places um, where you see good, positive things happen, but also organizations that people want to join, that they want to support? It's going to require a change in posture from community-based organizations, most especially faith-based organizations, away from a protest model to a partnership model. Again, I've been at the forefront of civil rights. I've been jailed many times and led huge protests around police accountability. But at this point, our best march is not on police departments, and especially Memphis, but with our law enforcement agencies. Since the death of George Floyd, we have seen not only a, a failure of a reduction in officer-involved tragedies, but there's been an increase in officer-involved tragedies, both where officers are taking the lives of people prematurely and where officers are being attacked and assaulted. At the same time, crime and violence is rising. Our posture has to change if we're going to change those things. What I mean by that is we need to look for ways not just to challenge or protest police, but every faith-based organization ought to be ought to be looking for a way to partner with law enforcement. And through that partnership, not only can you hold them accountable, but you can support them. And that's what it's going to require. We need a change of posture, a change of narrative, a change of direction. There has never been a movement for positive social change in American history that was not anchored in the faith space. Dr. King gave his life right there in Memphis. He was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. It was Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, Reverend Fred T. Shuttlesworth, Reverend Billy Kyles. So many great civil rights icons were at the forefront of the civil rights movement because they were faith leaders. We need every church, every single faith-based organization, every single group, not to just challenge the Memphis Police Department, but to collaborate with them, hold them accountable when they're wrong, but when they're right, the vast and overwhelming majority of the time, we have a moral obligation to stand in solidarity with them. And that's what I call upon the Memphis community to do. The police department can't 
fix itself. They can't fix all the problems by themselves. They need some partners. And that's what those faith-based and community groups should be doing at this moment, this critical moment in history. You say you are CEO of Movement Forward. Uh, briefly explain what that is and um, tell us what kind of presence it has here in the Memphis community. So Movement Forward is a uh, solution-focused human and civil rights organization that's inclusive and, and modern. We take the best of the civil rights movement principles and move them forward into collaborative space. So it's not just black versus white. One of the challenges that we've seen over the last several years when it comes to policing that we take a distinctly different posture of uh, or than is we saw too many people in one corner yelling, our lives matter, different folks in different corners yelling and screaming different messages. We've never progressed when we separate or segregate ourselves from one another. What we do at Movement Forward is look forward to opportunities to bring communities and law enforcement, communities and governments, communities and corporation together to actually solve problems. Too much of what has become of social justice is adversarial. But whatever it is that we fight, we ultimately invite. Our, our principle, the premise of our organization, is to bring people together to solve problems. And that's what we're doing in collaboration with the Memphis Police Department. Uh, our anchor signature program is National Faith and Blue Weekend. It's the largest police community outreach project in American history. The Memphis Police Department, uh, Chief Davis and Sergeant Tadero Holmes and so many other great people there at the Memphis Police Department put together events the second weekend in October that actually bring the law enforcement community and the law and the community at large together. Again, we have to put solutions on the table. The challenges that we face when it comes to crime and trust will not be solved by legislation. They will be resolved by relationship. And that's what we focus on here in our organization is that kind of relational reformation. Reverend Markel Hutchins, uh, really appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, we, uh, we certainly are, are rooting you on and, and uh, uh, thank you for this interesting discussion. We appreciate all the knowledge. And if someone wants to get some more information about this, where can they go? They can visit us at movementforward.org, movementforward.org, or specifically around Faith and Blue Weekend. And I, I cannot emphasize enough that uh, we, we just will not solve these problems in silos. The police department can't do it by themselves and the community can't do it by ourselves. We need one another. I encourage everybody to visit us at faithandblue.org and follow us on social media at Faith and Blue and follow me at Rev Markell. Okay, Reverend Markel Hutchins, uh, once again, thanks so much uh, for the time this morning. We appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank you. Did you know that 64% of Americans typically abandon their New Year's resolution within the first month? That doesn't surprise me at all. And you know what's at the top of the list typically? It has to deal with getting in shape, and it also has to deal with your financial shape. you got to get in your financial shape. And so many people just abandon this after that first month. Well, it's time to get back on track when it comes to your finances. And here to help us out is the founder of the Fiscal Femme. We are joined now by Ashley Feinstein Gersley. Thank you for joining us, Ashley. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. 
No, I appreciate it. So let's talk about the number one tip to getting our budgets back on track. It is, you know, it is February. It's mid-February. Maybe some people have lost track of their New Year's resolutions. How do we get it back on track, Ashley? My number one tip is to purge expenses that you won't miss or aren't using. And to clean up the finances, look at what you've spent so far this year. Are there subscriptions that you aren't using or completely forgot about? Or maybe there are expenses that aren't adding much value or happiness to your life. We want to let go of those expenses first. Always good advice. You know, I mean, it's like we, we have to pay off all of our bills from the holiday season. And it's like, oh, we need a way to get back on track. There are a lot of tools out there to make sure that we're spending properly, that our spending is in order. Are there any that you would recommend, Ashley? Just like you said, with the holidays, sometimes we need some time to pay things off. So we want to make our finances flexible. I've partnered with a firm and I recommend them because they offer a transparent way to pay over time on your own schedule on anything from last minute travel expenses, home essentials, electronics, and even car repair without the hidden fees or compound interest that you might find with credit cards. Good advice there. And, uh, you know, I've heard this before that uh, uh, people like a high credit score. In fact, they find it sexy if your finances are in order. And we saw this in a uh, new survey out that financial stability is sexy. Tell me more. Yes, if you needed one more reason to stick with your money resolutions, financial stability is sexy. A recent survey from a firm showed that consumers are prioritizing finances in their relationship. And actually the majority, three out of four, say that financial stability is a turn on. So if you are looking for love or looking to rekindle some love, you want to get that budget in order. And a great way to do that is to surround yourself by friends, family, loved ones who will help you and support you in your money goals. You know, I remember hearing something a few years ago when they were when when there was, you know, Match.com and all these online um, dating apps. They talked about, well, what is your credit score? And I thought that that was kind of funny and foolish. But in actuality, <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. You know, what is your financial stability? Um, it, it, that's that's uh, that's interesting how it is. What about um, any other final advice that we haven't hit on yet? We want to simplify, simplify, simplify. So the easier it is to keep our finances in order, the easier it is to stay on track. And a great place to start is with our accounts. Do you have extra savings accounts, checking accounts, or have you been meaning to roll over a company 401k? We want to consolidate and simplify. And we can also do that with our budget. So the fewer categories we have, the easier it is to track and maintain. And we can always add details later. And another, another final tip is to make our spending intentional. Every time we spend money, we have the opportunity to vote for more of the world we want to see and to align our spending with our values. And that might mean switch a recurring expense over to a BIPOC or woman-owned business or to purchase goods from a company working to be more sustainable. And often when our spending is more intentional, it has the wonderful side effect of actually reducing the amount we spend. I like that. I like all of that. Now, um, for more information on where people can go to get more of what we talked about, where can they do that? Yes, they can learn more about a firm at affirm.com and can follow along my budgeting tips at the Fiscal Femme. Okay, Ashley Feinstein Gersley, the Fiscal Femme founder. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you so much for having me.
Andrew Douglas back here in the Action News 5 Digital Test. September is World Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and a lot of times when you have a parent that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it doesn't just affect them. It affects the entire family. It affects the caregivers. It affects the entire network. And a lot of times there is that feeling of loneliness that comes with it. Well, now there is an online support group that is trying to help that. It's called PG, uh, Parenting Aging Parents. And I'm joined now by the founders, the co-founders of this online support community. Uh, Kim and Mike Barnes, they are joining us there uh, in, from Texas, right? Good morning to you both. Yes. That's right. We're in Austin, but yeah. but the issues the issues are, are worldwide. <laughs> yes, no question about it. Um, good morning to you. Thanks for for being with us. I I have uh, an aging uh, parent. I have a father who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's several years ago. So mm -hmm. this is uh, right in my wheelhouse. I know exactly what what mm -hmm. you're um, what you guys are going through. Tell me about uh, the idea of this online support community and why it was important for you both to discover this and ignite this and, and really kind of make sure that everyone knows about it. Well, it came about because of my mom having Alzheimer's and going through all of that, which as you know, is not a very fun thing to do. But but as my mom's Alzheimer's got worse and worse and worse, we talked to my dad, my sister and I did, about having to move her to memory care because things were getting so bad. And and my dad said, that's fine, y'all are in charge. <laughs> so we went and looked at the four memory care places pretty close to where they lived, and we felt so overwhelmed. We had no idea what questions to ask, what to look for, what the red flags might be. So we were very 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 overwhelmed and when he came home from that trip he said i feel like if we were really prepared with all the legal and financial and all of those documents and and information that you feel like is the important stuff that you need to have which it is important to have yet he 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 said if we felt that overwhelmed and felt prepared i can't imagine how most people feel and during that time we were also going through challenges with my mom who is uh lives in a different city than we are and has been diagnosed with mixed dementia and just we've had to take the checkbook away and we've had to you know, incur we had to sort of get her not to quit to, not to drive anymore and so all of those things and so when mike said i feel like we should help people the easiest thing we thought to do would be let's start an online community a free private facebook group to let people to bring people together because you you can often feel like surely i'm the only person doing this and then you realize once you start asking around everybody is but just nobody talks about it yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally get what you're saying. And, and so here is this um, online place for support for that family, those caregivers out there. When people go to this site and go ahead and give us the, the web address or where people can find this group, what can they find in mm -hmm. addition to that support? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the website is parentingagingparents.com, and on the website, we have more than 50 interviews with experts, you know, with, with lawyers, with doctors, with, with insurance people about Medicare, Medicaid, all kinds of things, because mm -hmm. there's so much information out there that you just have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. And when, when you're the, the young adult or the older adult caregiver <laughs> of an aging parent, child. yeah, the adult <laughs> child of a caregiver, you don't know what to look for, what questions you're asking, what's available out there. So that helps that. But we also figured out very quickly that so many people in this type of, of condition, this state of their life, feel so alone because it's not something that you bring up with people. Mm -hmm. You don't go to your neighbors or go to a party or go to work and say, yeah, I'm not doing too well with the Alzheimer's. How are you doing today? It just doesn't go that way. So the, so the the on the website, you'll find all those interviews and then also a button that leads right to joining the Facebook group if they're interested. And, and, and within that group, you just see people supporting and helping each other, giving insight and sharing experiences. Because if there's one thing that I've learned from my mom getting scammed multiple times that I can tell somebody else to help them either figure out what to do when that happens or prevent it, that's awesome. I, I love being able to do that because as as I mentioned, we don't talk about it and we can't help each other if we don't talk about it. So it really just brings people together to have that safe place to be able to say, I don't know what to do. Here's the situation or that kind of thing to really feel supported and feel like you have others that can appreciate and understand what you're going through. Those scammers out there that call, uh, I, I want to like reach out mm. across the phone, into the phone and just yes. strangle them. Uh, it is so uh. frustrating how they prey on some of these older, older Americans out there. Um, tell me mm -hmm. when, when you um, are, are kind of looking and set up this site, uh, parentingagingparents.com, 
What are some of the biggest questions that you guys get on the site? Oh gosh, I think it's everything from my my mom doesn't want to uh, or dad doesn't want to quit driving. What should we do? Uh, my um, parent is having doesn't want to admit that there's a problem or that they are having memory challenges or other physical challenges and they don't want to potentially leave home or even if they want to stay at home they don't want to bring in care yeah or many times it's a case of or mom and dad are getting so old that they don't they really can't handle things themselves anymore but i don't have a power of attorney i don't know what to do is it too late they have a little bit of dementia what's going to happen there there are so many questions out there and and luckily there are so many people in the group that different people and different different Situation. providers are, are also a part of the group that are able to give a little bit of advice and help people out mm -hmm. How many people do you have on that site, and, uh, and and is there is there any kind of fee, or can people just join for free? Yeah. It's a free Facebook group. We have about 30. We're getting up close to 4,000 people from all around the country and even a few from around the world. But yeah. because I think that you know, while state by state, some of the legal things might be a little bit different, Medicaid may operate just a, a little bit different. But when it comes to especially the emotional support, so many of those challenges are the same, whether it's you know, I had a really tough relationship with my parent growing up. And now that I'm trying to help take care of it, that brings all of those frustrations and difficulties back. Maybe it's the siblings aren't uh, are, are having a challenge getting along or deciding what's the best thing for our parents. And so I think that it's it's, you know, how do we bring people together? But yeah, we want it. We want to be able to keep that uh, Facebook group free. And so that it can that anybody who needs it is available to to help. Yeah, because it, it's a great place to vent. And that, that's the, the biggest thing I think that I've seen that, that kind of surprised me in some ways, because I have Kim to be able to vent to at times if I run into something. But but there's so many things that you run into as an adult child of an aging parent, especially one with Alzheimer's. So a recent mm -hmm. time when I went to visit my mom, the uh, first thing that came out of her mouth was, I don't recognize you. And the second thing that came out of her mouth was, are you my brother? And then the third thing that came out of her mouth was, why are you here? Uh, and that's not fun. I'm her only son. Yeah. She's the only mom I've ever had. So, you know, when something like that happens, it hurts. It's, it's not fun to deal with, but this gives you a platform, a, a community to be able to express yourself and, and say, how it feels to you and, and get the support that you need. And, and sometimes makes you, and this is maybe this isn't the right way to say, it, but it makes you feel like you're not crazy, that you're not the, that you don't think yeah. the feelings that I'm having, the the guilt that I'm feeling, the the love I'm feeling. I mean, all of those, the gamut of emotions that you, you realize that that's normal and that other people are having those same experiences too. Thank you so much for setting this up uh, because I think this is a wonderful resource for so many people um, that have older parents that are going through this or perhaps just, just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In fact, if you were reaching out right now and you knew that someone just had their older parent um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, is there a top three checklist that you would tell somebody or top five checklists that you would tell them right now, here's what you have to do in order to just kind of, um, you know, you got the diagnosis, here are the three to five things you need to do right now. What would you tell them? I'd say depending on how far along they are, make sure you've got all your legal documentation in place. Because if that once they progress to a point where they're not competent to be able to make decisions and you don't already have that power of attorney and some of that other legal uh, documents in place, it's too late. Yeah. So making sure you have as much of that um, that you can. Figure things out about housing. As far as what were their wishes or what are their wishes? Do they want to stay in their home? Do they Can they afford to go to memory care or assisted living or independent living? You know, what's the situation mm -hmm. with housing to make things easier there? And then I think educating yourself just is what to expect because uh, Alzheimer's or other dementias are not necessarily, it's not an overnight thing generally. And so there's going to be time to be able to uh, prepare a little bit and know what to expect and be able to find those people that can support you as you're going along the way. Mike has a friend whose parent is one stage ahead. And so they've been, a, he's been a great resource for Mike to be able to kind of know what to, to, to know what's coming next. And, you know, within our group, we have so many people, I, I think dementia in general, which is, as we've learned, is just one type. Uh, Alzheimer's is just one type of dementia, uh, but the, but the most common type is that uh, there's no matter what the physical or mental or um, you know, cognitive challenge is, we all need that support. Yeah. 
Well, Kim and Mike Barnes, we appreciate you and we appreciate everything that you're doing. Parenting agingparents.com. Thanks so very much for not only creating this site, this online resource for everyone, but also uh, giving uh, some tips and, uh, and, and some friendly reminders for everyone out there that's going through that. God bless you both. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we're going to switch gears. Of course, we told you earlier, March is National Women's History Month, but did you know March is also endometriosis? endometriosis month that's a very long word but here to speak with me this morning is uh, dr patrick cleden with the saint francis medical partners good morning to you good morning thanks so much for sticking around with us you can probably speak more to this uh, than i can but tell me what is endometriosis endometriosis is a condition where the uh, endometrial tissue, which is what normally makes the lining of the uterus, is found outside of the, the uterus. And that tends to create a condition where there's pelvic pain that can be cyclic or chronic, and it can also cause pain with intercourse and, and even infertility. Okay, so what are some of the common symptoms there? Most common symptoms would be pelvic pain and cyclic pelvic pain. Uh, the other symptoms that we see, like I said, are, are sometimes pain with intercourse and, and sometimes even infertility due to some of the uh, consequences of the endometrial tissue. So talk to me a little bit about some of the treatment options for this. So there are medical treatment options and that uh, include pain control options with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. There are hormonal options like birth control. Uh, there's even surgical options uh, to go in and remove some of the endometrial tissue and some of the scar tissue that is abnormal. Okay, so are there any like lifestyle changes you can make to help alleviate the chances of you getting endometriosis? Uh, unfortunately, there aren't any sp specific lifestyle interventions that can be done to prevent it. Uh, it's something that is treatable once it's identified and treated. As you mentioned earlier, you, did you say there is no cure, right? Or There's no known really cure, but there are some okay. treatments that have varying levels of effectiveness for, for patients. Okay, so how can people learn more about this? So if you have symptoms such as chronic pain that tends to get worse around the time of your cycle, um, if you are experiencing problems with infertility, I would recommend talking to your provider and seeing if it fits the clinical picture, and then they can talk to you about treatments that may improve your symptoms and, and establish a firm diagnosis. Oh, I love that. And it's never too early to learn about things like this. What's the age bracket to where it can impact you? The most common age range is women of reproductive age. It, it's rarely seen outside of that in women who are younger or older, but for the most part, it is, is typically women of reproductive age who are having menstrual cycles that, that tend to notice this type of pain. Okay, great information there, uh, Dr. Cleden. Is there any additional information you can tell us that I did not ask you today? Uh, the big thing would be, like I said, just stay in touch with your provider and, and know that this is a treatable condition and, and there are things that can be done to help improve your quality of life. All righty, again, that was Dr. Patrick Cleden. Thank you so much for stopping by the digital desk today Thank you. and speaking with us. See ya. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us here on the Action News 5 Digital Desk. My friends, a first alert to heavy rainfall potential here over the course of the next couple of days. It starts today. As you're heading out the door, you'll need the umbrellas, the rain jackets all day long. Temperatures hovering in the 60s, and of course, rain will come in waves. So it may not rain constantly, but it may be raining persistently over the next couple of days. Of course, the midweek impact heavy rainfall, several inches of rain through Thursday. And this is something that we got to keep in the back of our mind. Water rises from our creeks, tributaries, main stem rivers, as well as uh, some of the storage uh, areas, uh, say Sardis Lake, uh, Grenada Lake, and Enid Lake. Uh, that's something that we'll be watching here the next couple of days because, of course, the water is going to start to come up. That's going to start to flow down a stream and eventually make its way down towards the Mississippi, uh, the uh, Yazoo River backwater as they have to discharge some of that water. Not to mention, 
Uh, we've got water coming down the Mississippi that's going to have some big rises probably here, not to the point to where we're talking big flooding, but definitely noticeable considering that it has been so dry as of late. Remember, we were dealing with a huge deficit along the Mississippi River back a couple of months ago, and now we're back to almost full capacity along the river as we approach a minor flood stage here soon enough. Here's a look at what we got going on as far as the rainfall is concerned. Again, it's not just here. You got to think about what's going on upstream as well. Some upstream water rises are expected along the Ohio and uh, Mississippi, Mississippi River Valleys and also for our Tennessee River Valley folks as well. That's going to start heading down towards uh, across this area and it's going to be a very messy go of things here in the next few days. Heavy rainfall. You see the red areas. Those are three plus inches of rainfall and some spots could be even higher than that. I will say it's looking more likely that we'll have some pockets here in North Mississippi where we will probably be approaching by the time we get towards Thursday three to five inches. I think most spots though, uh, especially north of I 41 to three and then two to four is a general rule south, but there will be some pockets of five inches of rain, not out of the realm of possibility. Now, when you look at this again, this is where the flooding potential would like to be again across the Mississippi uh, Delta into south southern portions of Arkansas, and northern Louisiana, down towards about Jackson, Mississippi. Tomorrow, the moderate risk for flooding goes a little farther to the east here in Memphis and across the mid south. We're underneath a slight risk for flooding the entire next two days. That's more so low lying, poor drainage, flooding, flooding. Uh, so that's something that we'll be watching as well. That may slow you down. In addition to the rainfall, the potential for an isolated strong storm or two Nile, the realm of possibility later on today here in uh, portions of East Central Arkansas, and Northwest Mississippi. And also tomorrow, a little better chance, but even that not the worst looking scenario playing out. I think wind and hail the primary issue for us, uh, but the farther south that you go, you see this red area. That's a moderate risk for severe weather, and it does look like uh, damaging winds, tornado risk also in play here. Jackson, Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, down towards Hattiesburg, uh, Meridian, and the farther north that you go, you start losing the instability, but it's still plenty of moisture to work with and enough that we could feature a risk for a few stronger storms. Thursday, a quieter day from the standpoint of severe weather and flooding, but still some rain in play. Let's go with our first alert future cast again. Some showers and storms. There might be one or two gusty ones making their way across portions of North Mississippi late this afternoon, and that will shift out of here. The thing is that we'll go into a relative lull in the activity. Rain showers pretty light as we get closer to uh, five, six o'clock. There's another wave that moves across portions of Mississippi that will shoot northward some rain opportunities. A little bit of a lull tomorrow morning. Another wave of rain and storms, maybe a gusty storm or two as we get towards your Wednesday late morning, early afternoon. Re relative lull in the activity late afternoon into the early evening. More rain moving through here overnight Wednesday into early Thursday, and that will be about the last part of the heavy rain aspect. We may need to up the rain chance on Thursday uh, to cover the lingering effects of the rain that will be pushing across the mid south. Temperatures in the 60s to near 70 overnights in the 60s and 50s. The rain will start to taper off, but as we go through Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to start to kick up 30 35 mile per hour wind gusts on Wednesday, 30 to 40 mile per hour wind gusts come Thursday. We'll still still say breezy on Friday. The high near 70 will go upper 70s as we get closer to the upcoming weekend with a chance for a few showers to return by Monday of next week. All right, that does it for us here in the Action News 5 Digital Desk. Have yourself a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. Take it easy out there. There's some wet roads and some storms certainly on the way. we got Action News 5 Midday coming up at the top of the hour with Ariana Poindexter. She'll take you through the next hour with all the headlines and the weather that you can expect for the next 24, 48, 72 hours and beyond. And make sure you join us once again on the Digital Desk bright and early tomorrow morning. As always, Monday through Friday. From 7 until 11 on all of our digital platforms, on our website, actionnews5.com, our free news app, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, YouTube, and Roku, and digital channel 5.3, the Action News 5 Plus channel, and channel 907 on Xfinity. Have yourself a wonderful afternoon. Yes. Sure.